Happy Cyber Security Awareness Month. This video is a tutorial video on Ghidra. Now, if you don't know what Ghidra is, it's a tool that helps you reverse engineer binaries. Binaries meaning like a Windows program where you don't have the source code, but you have the binary and it lets you peek inside how the binary works, even though you don't have source code. And there's a little bit of an art to that. One little video tutorial is not going to cover everything. It's the kind of thing you got to work at over time. But even if you don't plan to work on it over time, but you're curious about it, I'd recommend sticking around. If you don't have any experience with it, I'd recommend you stick around because I'm going to start from kind of a very simple place. And even if you don't get a lot of it, that's fine. That's actually quite good if that happens. That feeling never actually goes away when you're learning new stuff, even if you've done it for decades, many, many years, doesn't matter. And you get used to knowing like, oh, that's a good feeling. That ambiguity, that kind of, you know, this is overwhelming. It's a whole bunch of stuff. If you get used to that, you can approach almost anything and nothing can get in your way. So that's what we're going to do with this. So I wouldn't worry if you know assembly language. I wouldn't worry if you know C and C++, because even if you don't know those things, this might be the first time you see them, you might get 10% of it, 50% of it, and that's good. So there's all kinds of value to get on a lot of different levels. So I'd recommend if you just have the slightest of interest, don't be intimidated by it. Come on in, set up your laptop. Let's download Ghidra. Let's get to it. Let's see what it's like to reverse engineer with Ghidra. All right, with all that said, let's get into it. Okay, here we go. We're on Windows 11 here and we're going to start up a browser and we're going to type in Ghidra. We type in Ghidra, usually the top result, but you got to make sure is going to be Ghidra gidra-sre.org. We are going to click on that and then we're going to go to download on GitHub and it brings us over to GitHub. And you should see at the top here, National Security Agency Gidra. Now we can see 10.4 is available. So we're going to click here on the zip file and it's going to start downloading. And while that's downloading, we're going to click on this SHA-256 hash. And we are going to go over here to the downloads folder and we're going to say open up this terminal. We're going to put a little comment symbol and paste the SHA-256 in there. We're going to do a little ls and we're going to do a get file hash here and we're going to specify the zip file and the algorithm is going to be SHA-256 and we want to see a match between this number that came from the website and this one that PowerShell calculated. Great, okay, so we have what seems to be a good download here, very good. Now, there are a couple of things here. So I wanna go and click on the installation guide here, and I wanna show minimum requirements. Now, I'm gonna show you the steps on how to set all this up and install it, so don't worry about reading all this right now. Okay, so you can see here that the Java JDK, which is the Java development kit, is required to run Ghidra. Now, there are a number of ways in which you can obtain a JDK. Now, one way is to go to Microsoft and get their JDK that they create for Windows users. But then there's also Amazon Coretto. So I'm going to open up this uh, web page here so you can kind of see. So here's Coretto 17. And now I'm going to also open this up and say Windows uh, 11 JDK. And we can see that Oracle, they have the top link here. And then right below that, there's the Microsoft build of OpenJDK. Now this is one search result for one search engine. You can check and just make sure that you're going to the right location for all of these. So if I click on the Microsoft build of the OpenJDK, it brings us here and we can just click download and then it'll take us to a web page that has a lot of different downloads. So we want OpenJDK 17 and we can download uh, JDK 17 here so I can download this MSI. By the way, notice here they have SHA-256 so we can actually check the SHA-256 of that. So I'm going to download that SHA-256 by clicking on here. Now let's go over to that downloads folder again and see if our downloads are there and they are right here. I'm going to cat this file and inside it contains the SHA-256 for the MSI file. So if I do a get file hash on the MSI file, right? So let's do algorithm SHA-256, enter. Both of these match. And I think we're going to download uh, the Amazon Coretto one as well. I'm going to show you things with both of those. Here's the Coretto website here and uh, they have a similar thing. You can see here's the Windows 64-bit MSI. Uh, I'm going to actually download the zip file for this because I'm going to show you how to use the zip file. They have a uh, checksum MD5. That's a different hash algorithm. But if you have a choice between MD5 and SHA-256, use the SHA-256 one. That's a better hash algorithm. And this is the one that we want 
in order to verify the zip file. We just downloaded a zip file. Well, this is the SHA-256 hash for this zip file, this Amazon Credo zip file. So we'll, we'll go over here. Here's Amazon Credo. We're going to actually run uh, the same get file hash off of that for the algorithm SHA-256. And you can see there's 2A and then here there's 71C2. And if you go here, you can see there's 71C2 and 2A72. And we can even do our same kind of uh, comparison check. So I can double click that paste it to the clipboard and go back over here and do control F and you can see it matches this 100%. All right, so let's check our inventory here. We downloaded Gidra, we downloaded a JDK from Microsoft and we downloaded an Amazon Coretto JDK. Now we didn't need to download two JDKs. We could have just downloaded one, but I'm going to show you how to install Microsoft's and we're going to get Gidra running with that and we're going to install Amazon Coretto and that's using a zip file. So it's a slightly different set of install steps and I just kind of wanted to go over that so you could kind of see the two variations. So the one where you download the uh, JDK from Microsoft, all you do is double click on the MSI. It prompts you, you click next, you accept the license agreement if you want to, make sure you read it thoroughly word for word, and then click next again and click install. Uh, you'll get a UAC prompt. That's the prompt that says, are you sure? It's up to you whether you want to click or not. I just clicked mine. I don't see a problem doing that with a download I get from Microsoft, but you have to evaluate everything, make sure everything's okay, look things over, etc. We just installed the Microsoft JDK. That's wonderful. And in fact, we can verify that by just opening up a terminal window and typing Java slash help and slash version. And that's wonderful. So it's installed. Okay, so now let's prepare Gidra here. So the way we're going to do that is we're going to extract Gidra. Gidra. Okay, Gidra was extracted. So this was the original zip file and it extracted it to here. And you notice there's an extra level here. And then we go in here and here's Gidra. So we're gonna get rid of this extra level by doing control X to cut. And then we're gonna paste it up here. Now this one should be empty and we just go in there to verify. We click the one up so that we can go here and just click delete. And now this is our Gidra extracted Gidra folder. Okay, so rather than run Gidra here on in downloads, what I want to do is copy all of these files over to a demo directory that I'm just going to put on the desktop. So I'm going to do control X to cut and then we're going to go to the desktop and I have a demo folder here which is empty and I'm going to paste these here and it's just going to move all these here. So if I go back over to downloads you can see downloads is empty and everything has been moved here. So we've installed the Microsoft JDK and we can see that by going to add remove. Let me just go to add remove. So you can see that right here in add remove the JDK has been installed and we've extracted Gidra and let's run Gidra first right now with the Microsoft JDK 17. We can go here and find Gidra run dot bat and double click. Oh, Windows protected your PC. Okay, so what's going on here? Well, when you download a zip file from an external site and you extract it to your local drive, Windows tracks that information. And if it detects like a batch file in there or some kind of executable, it's gonna start from a footing of blocking that unless it's something that it knows is okay for you to run. In this case, Windows Smart Screen apparently is not aware of this Gidra run.bat file. When you run Gidra run.bat for the first time, you may not see this. It may start fine for you if they change their smart screen with respect to this one batch file. But in our case, we need to take an extra step here. So click the don't run button. So you go to Gidra run.bat, right click, properties, and down here you'll see an unblock checkbox. Now you don't want to indiscriminately click that on any old download that you see or any old file. You usually want to do it when you know what you're doing. Now in this particular case, this batch file came from the NSA, from their uh, GitHub repository. So we have reasonable assurance that it's the same batch file that they created and it's part of Gidra. And so with that sort of assurance, we are going to click unblock. I'm just trying to point out that you don't just blindly click on block when smart screen tells you, hey, I'm not going to run this thing. You basically want to do your due diligence, take some steps to look into what is this executable? Is it the right one? Is it a good one? Etc. Etc. So in our case, we're going to unblock it. We're going to click OK. OK, now let's run Gidra. 
All right, you get a license agreement here and you click I agree after thoroughly reading it and making sure that you can abide by it. And now here's Gidra and Gidra is running. Now there's something I want to do here just to show you something that could be important for you. So uh, I've already done it on my system here and so you might run into the same thing and that's a scaling issue. So if you notice, this actually looks pretty good. We can see most of the uh, characters and everything. When I initially installed it, they were really small. So let's go over here. I'm going to run Gidra. Now this is a 4K display here. Uh, I'm recording it as 1080p. But if you notice, look how small it is. And it's really just too small for analysis and stuff. It's way too small. So what I did to resolve that in case you run into it. So we're going to exit Gidra here. What we're going to do is go find the Java W uh, EXE file. So if I say where Java W.exe, you can see it's right here. So I'm going to actually click I'm going to do Windows E to open up Explorer. I'm going to paste this into the Explorer address bar. And then I'm going to go down here and find Java W. And I'm going to right click on Java W. I'm going to do Properties and then Compatibility. And then there's a thing to change DPI. And this was not checked for me. So that was unchecked before. And then use this setting to fix scaling problems for this program instead of the one in settings. So use this setting. So we have use this setting. You can open up the advanced scaling box. I'm not going to do that. Uh, so I'm just going to click OK, OK. Now when we go run Gidra, you'll see it's being scaled much better. If you're interested in seeing how to use a zip file version of the JDK like Amazon Credo, uh, let's, uh, we're going to do that right now. So I'm going to exit uh, Gidra here. Here, I'm actually just going to remove the Microsoft JDK. I'm going to reinstall it before we get going um, after I do the Amazon Credo one. Uh, but for right now, I just kind of want to remove it completely. Now, with it removed completely, I'm going to try to run Gidra. Gidra can't find the runtime, as you can see. We're going to go back up to the demo folder here. We are going to extract Amazon Credo here. And as you can see, it has the, the directory that's the same name as the zip file. And then there's this smaller one inside. We're going to do the same thing that we did before, which is to click this smaller folder name in here. And we're going to bring this up to demo. So I'm going to do, I did control X there. And now I'm going to do control V. That's going to move it out of here. So this is now empty. We can click back up here, click delete. That goes away. So now we have this nice small JDK folder here. Gidra just simply requires us to put the bin file on our path. Okay, so I'm doing Alt D, Control C to put that on the clipboard. I'm gonna go to the start menu and type in edit. Click on edit the system environment variables. I'm gonna click on environment variables, double click on path. And then we're gonna add an entry to the path here like that. Click OK. Now, by the way, if you're editing the path in a dialog box that looks like this, where it's a single line, you basically want to put a semicolon after the last path, and then you paste in the JDK path like this right here. So it depends on which UI you're using to edit the path, but um, if you're using this kind of fancy schmancy one here, it's kind of easy. You can just double click and paste it right there to add it there. Okay, with that environment variable set, we're gonna go and run Ghidra. It's Ghidra, by the way. I've been saying Ghidra, you know, I don't know. I, I always forget that and I call it Ghidra. And voila, it's just easier and faster. Ghidra requires like a little bit more effort in the pronunciation, so forgive me for that. Ghidra. Ghidra. Okay. All right. Now, if you have the same scaling issue with Amazon Credo, you can actually go into the bin folder here as we did with the Microsoft JDK. Then you can right click and choose properties and compatibility and uh, change high DPI and you've got that. And you can actually see it's already been set here. Quick recap, what have we done? We downloaded Ghidra from the NSA's GitHub repo. We downloaded two JDKs, not because we had to, but because we demoed the one from Microsoft, which is an MSI installer, and one which is a zip file from the Amazon Coretta website. And we just did that to demo the two variations of installation, one being an MSI installer, the other one being sort of a portable zip file that you extract and put it where you want to. And then we started up Ghidra. There's actually one other thing that we want to get here, and that is uh, Visual Studio 2022. So let's go to downloads. And uh, I'm going to download the community version. If you have the other ones, that's fine. This one's free. And so I'm just going to use this one. 
Uh, in this particular case, we really only need the desktop development environment for C++. If you want to check the other ones, that's fine. And click install. I'm going to fast forward this so that we don't have to sit here through this. Okay, when Visual Studio first starts up, you can click skip this right now, or you can log in with your Microsoft account if you prefer. Uh, I'm not going to do that here. I'm just going to click skip this for now. I'm going to choose dark theme and Visual C++. So after the initial startup, uh, when you start Visual Studio, it starts to like a display like this and you can say, you know, create a new project, for example. And uh, for this project, what we're going to do is select languages C++, platform is going to be Windows, highlight console app and then click next. Now it's going to default to this repos directory. Uh, I'm going to go over here to the demo directory. I'm going to do an alt D control C to copy this folder and I'm going to pop that folder right in here. Then I'm going to do a control A select all demo app and then I'm going to click create and you can see it created a boilerplate app here so I'm going to go back over here to our demo folder and you can see here's the folder and inside here here's the uh, boilerplate app that's the same one as this uh, demo app uh, .cpp. so just really quick if you've never seen Visual Studio before or you've never programmed in C++ don't worry so watch what we're going to do here well let's just get rid of all this stuff you can read that if you want to or you can keep it there it's just a comment anything you see with the little slash slash is a comment we're just going to delete all that and then what we're going to do is go up here and we're going to say uh, build solution then we can go up here and we start without debugging and when we start this without debugging you can see it says hello world right there and that's the program that's running so we can hit the X there to dismiss it and uh, just to show you like this is the program one two three uh, and then I'll hit control S to save run this without debugging again so start without debugging and it'll run it and you can see that's that's our little C++ program so it gives you a little boilerplate C++ program to start with probably many of you have used C++ uh, you know but if you haven't that's fine and now you get a little taste of it just very quick just go along with this if you're not familiar with Visual Studio and you're not familiar familiar with debugging you certainly could follow these steps and you don't even have to know exactly what they do um, and, and I think sometimes that's a great way to learn uh, uh, you know if you feel like you're not allowed to try like that then you're just going to get in your own way so a really important box for our discussion here is going to be this concept of a release build or a debug build now if I put this on release and I build the program and you can see down here it's compiling it and compiling it means it's taking this text and it's turning it into binary code that the machine understands. The machine does not understand this. The CPU can't run this directly. But when we compile this, the compiler, which you can see is running down here, turns that text into something that the machine can understand. Okay, so there's this concept here of a release build and a debug build. So I'm on release and I'm going to compile it just as we did for the debug build. And I'm basically going to run it. So I'm gonna say start without debugging and you see something very similar it's almost like there's no difference but there is a difference the difference is internal and you can't see it and we're going to touch on that later on so it's going to become important okay so this release build and this debug build um, these are two different things and I'm going to explain generally why it's important to understand those nuances when it comes to reverse engineering and when you're approaching a binary it's very important to kind of be aware of those things and if it feels overwhelming to you that I'm throwing all this at you right now just don't worry about that let that feeling of overwhelm just kind of slough off and go behind you and enjoy being totally confused by everything right because the next time you go through everything you'll be a little less confused by it or whatnot and if you're an expert and you're right on top of everything here hey that's great so I I have debug selected and I compile with build solution so I can either hit F7 or choose this so for example I'll hit the F7 key here so we have build solution right so if I right now by hitting F7 I just built a debug build if I go and select release and I hit F7 I just built a release build 
Just keep in mind that when you compile something, you're turning that text that developers can understand into binary code that most developers don't have to deal with directly all the time. They usually deal with the logic that is expressed in the language, not the binary code created by the compiler. Unless you're using Ghidra and doing reverse engineering, in which case you do become concerned with the binary. That's kind of what we're doing here. So when you have debug build here selected and you compile the program into a binary executable, you're kind of doing the same thing that you do when you have release selected and you compile to build a binary executable. In fact, if we go to demo app, you can see here's the output folder. Notice there's two folders. This is the debug build and this is the release build. So it has two files in each one and you only really need one to run the program. We're going to get into that. That's kind of an important little tidbit. So let's start with the debug build. So the debug build has demo app.exe. That's the executable. That's a binary executable. That exe was created in part from this text, but there were other things added and stuff to make it ready to run in the operating system. The PDB is a symbol file, the tools like the compiler, and there's a thing called a linker. And we're not going to get into those. Just think of it really simply. Those are tools that take the text of the C++ program and it turns it into an EXE. So just keep in mind, there's a thing called a compiler, a thing called a linker. There's some other tools. You don't need to worry about that. That stuff comes over time and you can delve into it when you're ready. But at this time, demo app, okay, is the EXE, the binary that gets created by the compiler and the linker. And the PDB is a symbol file. So the symbol file, what is a symbol file? Well, a symbol file is a file that contains information that develops developers can use to debug the exe. The debugger uses the PDB file. The debugger uses the symbol file. It uses that symbol file to understand how this binary is constructed inside, how it's arranged, where all the variables are located and whatnot. Now, if you go to the release build, you'll notice there's an executable and there's a PDB. That's the thing that you run. That's the thing that the debugger uses. The PDB is the symbol file that the debugger uses to understand what the layout is or the arrangement is of this binary. You can almost think about the symbol file like a map. You know, it gives you the lay of the land. And if you have it, if you have the symbol file for an EXE, you sort of have a little advantage in being able to pick apart that EXE and understand what makes it tick inside. If you don't have the symbol file, you're faced with a tougher challenge. And what I'm getting at here is that when people use a tool like Ghidra to reverse engineer, what they're doing, what they're usually faced with, is they have an exe or a binary and they don't have the symbol file. But today we're going to start and do reverse engineering with the debug executable and the debug symbol file. And then we're going to look at the release executable and the release symbol file. And the reason why we're going to look at those is most of the time people are working in cybersecurity and they're doing malware analysis or they're looking for zero days. You know that sometimes security researchers are trying to examine the binary code that gets created so they can understand, hey, you know, is there a danger in this in this binary file? Sometimes when they do that, they don't have the symbol file. And I say most often they don't. Whenever you are faced with a tutorial or a problem for reverse engineering and they give you a cushy little symbol file with lots of nice, easy to read things and stuff like that, when you load it up in the uh, reverse engineering tool like Ghidra, they're giving you sort of a luxury experience that, you know, when people really get into reverse engineering, they don't always have that luxurious experience. So you might be asking then, well, what's the difference between the release and the debug if they both have those two files? Aren't those two files the same for each one? No, the release version, actually the compiler and the linker, the tools that create that exe file from this human readable text file that developers love to use this C++ language to write code. And then the tools, when the compiler and the linker create the exe, uh, they can create it a number of different ways. And when you create a release build, generally what you're doing when you select release is you're telling the compiler you're ready to create the exe that you're going to ship to the user, that you're going to give to the user. And the compiler and the linker 
are usually set up to create an EXE. They're going to spend more time translating this into the EXE because the compiler and the linker are going to look for ways to make it faster, more efficient, maybe even use less memory in some cases. These are all little options that can be chosen before you ship the software, the binary, the executable, the installer, etc. And generally speaking, usually executables, when they're compiled and built for release, so if you select release and you do build and build solution and it builds this executable here, it's going to do some extra work to make that executable much faster, which usually means doing some esoteric things to the instructions for the CPU, which are within that binary file. And the reason why that's important to understand is that endeavor of creating that more esoteric executable, which is usually done to create something that runs faster, more optimized, because developers usually want the user who's going to run the program to have an experience where things go much faster. That code that's in the EXE, the binary code, is usually more confusing to reverse engineer, more difficult to reverse engineer engineer because the compiler and the linker can take liberties to remove anything that's not necessary to make the most optimum machine code possible. What I'm trying to point out is that the debug binary, the EXE, that's usually a spacious, comfortable, I'm using metaphors here to make a point. That's an EXE that's meant for a debugger. It might be slower than the final program because it's not a release build. So it's going to be in longhand, really spelled out the machine instructions from this source code, which is what you call this human readable text code, this C++ code. Those machine instructions are going to have a closer one-to-one -one one mapping, and again, I mean that as a metaphor, one-to-one -one mapping from what you see in the source code to what you can see and perceive in the binary. The point here is that when you're going to reverse engineer an executable and you have a debug build of an executable, generally speaking, regardless of the platform, regardless of the context, regardless of the OS, if you're reverse engineering, you know, all other things being equal, if you're reverse engineering a debug build of something, you you're going to have an easier time than somebody who has to reverse engineer a release build because the release builds very often are doing crazy tricky things based on the hardware they're targeting. And I'm exaggerating when I say that, D depending on somebody's prowess with a particular platform, they might not view it as crazy tricky or whatever. But if you really compare debug binary code with release binary code, you can really see the difference after you get into it. And you will, if you continue to use Ghidra to look inside of executables and to experiment with that, you will see what I'm talking about. And we're going to get a taste of that in this tutorial. So what we need right now is a small piece of software, a small program that we're going to build. So let me take the sample program and I'm going to copy and paste it right into here. This sample program may, you know, if you don't know C++, it may look very long. I'm actually going to scroll down slowly so that you can see it here and you can freeze the video. It's actually not that long. You know, you can freeze this tutorial and you can go to your Visual Studio. And I think it's useful if you haven't done any C++ before to type in what you see. So for example, I'm repeating the line just above and you can just type in the same stuff that you see on screen and that'll be good if you haven't used C++ and you haven't used Visual Studio. It'll be a good exercise for you to type this stuff in and become familiar with the editor uh, and get it to match what you see here on screen. So this is a very simple program. It's not that big. That's the end of it down there. There's nothing else down here. It's only 53 lines long and basically it has some stuff in here and it does some things and we're going to build it and we're going to run it right now and we're going to look at it rather than examine the source code right now. So you can, if you know C++, you can examine this. Most people who, if they're pros with C++, they already know what I'm doing here. And it's very common when you have a Ghidra tutorial for people to have some executable and it has some password. And our goal is going to be to figure that out. But the trick here in the tutorial is usually when you're reverse engineering with Ghidra, you only have the binary 
binary, not the source code. So try to pretend that you don't have this source code. Enter it in and build uh, the solution here. And when you build this solution, I would build it for release and I would also build it for debug. So notice how it says debug and you can do build solution or you could just do rebuild solution if you want to. Uh, that's fine too. That'll just force it to rebuild everything aside from only the things that have changed. So like if you choose build, it only builds the things that have changed and you do rebuild, it rebuilds everything. So this is kind of a safe way to just make sure everything's rebuilt. So basically you'll select debug and you'll choose build solution or rebuild solution and then you'll choose release and you'll choose build solution or rebuild solution take your pick. Let's not make a big deal out of the tools and the IDE. By the way, Visual Studio is an IDE. You know, don't 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 make a big deal out of any of this if you're not familiar with it. Just kind of go through the steps. You know, that's it's, it's really the best way. If you get too cerebral about it, you'll sit around thinking you can't do it and all that. It, don't do that. Just step into it, go through the motions. It's good. All right. So with all that said, we've now built these and you can see here they are. Uh, there's the release and there's the debug. So let's actually open up uh, a terminal here in this window. So all I did is I right clicked in here and I chose open terminal. Uh, if you're on like Windows 10, what you could do is uh, Windows X and you can choose terminal and then go over and do alt D and then control C and then you can type in CD and you'll go there. So these are two different ways of getting to the same thing. But Windows 11 by default gives you this little right click open terminal. And so I'm just using that. It gives you a little PowerShell terminal. OK, so here is the demo app. So we can just try running the demo app. It wants my full name, uh, some user. OK, and it says, hello, some user. I hope you have a great day. Well, that's pretty interesting there. Um, it's, you know, I'm, I'm actually kind of, uh, you know, that's kind of, you know, interesting to see, you know, that. I mean, it's not really doing much, so it looks like there's not much more to that program. Well, we can examine this further. Now, there's some interesting things you can do to examine a program like this. For example, um, you can use uh, Visual Studio and you can say in here, open file and go up to the demo app, the top demo app directory, and then go in to, let's say, debug build, select the exe, and then on the open box, choose open with, and then you can go down and choose binary editor and we're not going to do much here i just want to show you this is the binary file in raw format this is a hex dump or a binary dump of the executable so you can kind of see like that's it generally so we we actually aren't going to look at it from this perspective for very long so i also want to show you if you have vs code so if you don't have vs code um, but you want to install it um, you can actually install VS Code. So I'm going to download VS Code. I'm just going to click Windows. A downloader will start here. Okay, I'm going to run that download, that installer. And I'm going to say I accept and click Next. And it's going to install this to a default location. I like to add this. So you add this to explore the right click options. So you can do whatever you want there. Um, we're just going to do this really quickly here. So I just want to show you this is another way of looking at the contents of the binary file. OK, we're going to launch Visual Studio. OK, once VS Code starts, I'm going to go to the marketplace here. I'm going to type in hex. And the top result here is going to be one from Microsoft called Hex Editor. I'm going to click Install. And after it's finished installing, uh, I'm going to exit from that. I'm going to drag the um, demo app, the you know, the, the debug build into Visual Studio Code. And then I'm going to choose open anyway. It doesn't want to open it because it's a binary file. And now I'm going to choose hex editor. Now it's telling me that, well, this is being obfuscated. Let me actually uh, do this. You can see here that it could not register a service here. Uh, I think this might be because it's in restricted mode. Uh, let me try exiting one more time and actually just loading this directly open oh no okay i guess it just needed a restart all right so i don't know what went on there actually myself i'm not going to stop to look at it right now but anyway this is another way of looking at uh binary files and you can kind of see there's a lot of stuff in here there, there's some other utilities you can run on these binary files we're actually not going to get into that today like for example you can run utilities to dump the strings inside of the executables and things like that uh, we're, we're just going to stick on this path i just wanted you to get a peek of the binary file from the standpoint of both the uh, hex view 
Viewer Binary Editor in Visual Studio and a similar Hex Viewer Binary Editor in VS Code. Now, by the way, in all these steps we just did, do not modify the executable. In fact, what I'm going to do right now, and you can do this too just to be safe, go here and choose Rebuild All while you're in release mode and then go to Debug Build and choose Rebuild Solution. And the reason why is if you accidentally modify those files, rebuilding them will recreate them. So at least they won't be broken. Like if you modified them in a way that would be broken for our demo, that wouldn't be good. Here we have um, these files. And what I want to do is actually go back here to the, de the demo. And as you saw, I could say, hello, me. And it says, hello. Hello, hello me. I hope you have a great day. So we don't really know what's going on with this. So what we're going to do is we're going to go up here and we're going to launch Gidra. So start up Gidra. And uh, I'm going to close the tips there and I'm going to say new project and we're going to say non shared project and I'm going to call this demo app uh, reversing. OK, and we can keep this located. Well, you know what I'm thinking is we can actually keep this off of here. So I will actually say uh, Gidra work. And I am going to put this here. And then I'm going to click finish. You can see it created some files that it's going to maintain in there. And it's kind of useful if you if you put the Gidro, if you don't put it, it's going to put it in a default location. And that's fine. You can copy stuff from there. I put it here so so we know where it's located and we could back it up. You know, if you do a lot of work and you've saved a lot of work from your reverse engineering and you want to back it up, you could back it up to a USB drive and that kind of thing. OK, so the next thing we want to do is go into demo app again. Let's start with the debug build. There's the exe binary and then there's the symbol file and that's that sort of map or outline that the debugger uses to kind of know about the internals of the binary right here. Well Gidra knows how to find these if you have them nearby and it will use this if it finds a matching PDB for the EXE it will use it to help show you things in a friendly manner within its user interface. So we're just going to drag this EXE over here to this node and it's going to automatically start prompt processing it and it's going to prompt us. Now we're going to select all the defaults on this. So portable executable is the name for these binary files that are used on Windows. On Linux, you'll see the term ELF. They have ELF format files. And there are different format files depending on the platform and depending on the context. In Windows, generally, you're talking about the portable executable format. So Ghidra here has recognized that this is a portable executable and it's just asking you to confirm and you can tell it, it sees that it's little endian. We're not going to get into what that means. That's what LE means and uh, 64 bits. And I'm going to actually go and just click OK. And you can see it processing through a bunch of stuff here. And once it starts up, you'll see it shows you a bunch of information. This might be handy. And actually, you can access this information even after you go past this dialog box. But right now, we're just going to click OK. OK, so if you double click on this executable here in the project, it will take the default action, which is to open up the analyzer and the disassembler and all the stuff we're about to see. This is all the magic of Ghidra right now. If I double click on that, it's starting it up. Some people refer to this as the dragon and it's asking us, the dragon's asking us, do you want, do you want me to analyze this? And we'll say, yeah. And it's going to give us a bunch of default options. This is kind of more advanced stuff and whatnot for right now. Just click analyze. And this is going to take a while and it's going to analyze things. And you can see the status a little bit here in the lower right corner. OK, you might see an auto analysis summary that has some warnings and stuff. You can just click OK to dismiss that. Don't worry about it right now. Now, I want to go back to the C program for a second. And I want to point out, if you remember in that small program, there was a main program. And here, there's a main program. Generally speaking, in C and C++, everything starts in the main function. Now that can change for different style applications like a Windows GUI application has a win main function, but this is a console application. So it has a main function and main goes back a long way. So Linux uses main and it's like a C and C++ construct. OK, so if we go back to Ghidra, you can see that it puts you on the main function. So Ghidra in this case was able to discover the main function and it puts 
puts you there as a starting point. Now, paradigm shift. Put in your head as though you don't have that source code that you used in Visual Studio to create this binary. Pretend you have the binary, the exe, which we've loaded here, and that PDB, that symbol file. Now, with that in mind, you don't have this source code to go look at. If you had this source code to go look at, you would have no need to be here in Ghidra. Ghidra. <laughs> Sorry. So keep that in mind, and it's a great way to learn to not look at the source code and see if you can figure some things out by looking in Ghidra. So that's what we're going to do today. We're going to look at Ghidra here, and then we're going to bounce a little bit to the source code. What we're going to try to do initially here is look at the stuff here in Ghidra and then try to see some things in here, and then we're going to go back to the command line to see if we can do something on the command line more than just what we were able to do before. If I go back to the command line, all all we know right now is if I type, you know, howdy uh, duty, I don't know how to spell it, but hello, howdy duty, and that's all it does. It seems like it doesn't do anything. There's no help text that I can see. It's not listening to my switch there, so it doesn't seem to do much. Is there more to this executable than meets the eye? Well, there is. Okay, so what you can see here, look what Ghidra does for us. Look at what it does. It doesn't have source code, okay? Keep that in mind. So you might think that this code you're looking at here, if I make this window bigger, you might think that this this code here is something that looks very complex and you know whatever but it used to be a long time ago well not so long ago actually where the tools that would help you reverse engineer um, prior to Ghidra and prior to some other tools that used to do this for you they didn't give you this kind of disassembly that you see here actually this is like a decompiling they call it disassembly is is more like what you see here and we'll talk about those terms but in here you can see this decompiling so what Ghidra is trying to do, so what Ghidra is doing in this window here is it's showing you the best C++ code that it knows how to create without having the source code. So if we look at this, we can see that it has some things going on in here, and we're going to examine this right now. When we go in here, we can see that there's lots of things going on, but one thing we do know is that when we run this program, and I type in here, like, how do you duty. Okay, well, we know that it is prompting us with please enter your full name, and we know that it's responding with like, hello, comma, and whatever you typed in, and I hope you had a great day. So if we go in here and you know, sometimes it helps not to go top down line by line, but just get a feel for, you know, at first you might just say, well, how big is this? And scroll down to the bottom. And then you might skim from the bottom up, right? So if you look here, there's a lot more text in here. Look at this. There's some text in here. There are no more features in this program. Well, we never saw that text. So we can see that there's some text in here that we haven't made uh, the program output. So it almost hints that maybe there's something more to this program. If you go here, it's says here, please do tell me a secret, will you? Well, that's kind of interesting because, um, uh, you know, I'm just kind of wondering, like, wh where is that coming from? Because we didn't see that when we ran the program, and we see very good. So you see, you don't have to necessarily go from the top down, but you can. So I'm just trying to say, you can maybe skim through at first and kind of look for human readable text. You might not see any in many cases when you're doing reverse engineering, but there might be some cases that are simple, like this one, where you start to see a lot of clues right off the bat. Oh, Oh my gosh, look at this. There's I hope you have a I hope you have a great day. That's the, we we recognize that one. I hope you have a great day. Oh, look, here's hello. There's a thing here that says hello. And then what does it say over here? So we go back over here and look at the behavior of the program. Hello, comma, whatever we typed in, and then I hope you have a great day. Well, look what we found here. We we have hello, comma, and then there's some processing here, and then it has I hope you have a great day. Well, this looks like the code that creates this response that we're getting here. Let's take a closer look at this. Okay, this says hello, comma. Well, we know that when we type in demo app, I can type in anything here. So anything typed here, it seems that this thing says hello and whatever I typed in, and then it says I hope you have a great day. Well, it seems as though this line here may be doing something that is outputting whatever we typed in. Now, in C++, if we go to the source code, there is a function here and a feature where you'll see count, C, C 
out, which is console out. And any text which is located here is going to be sent out to the terminal window or to the console, as you have seen. So all I'm trying to point out is count and less than less than and then a string is a way of sending output that the user will see in the terminal. So if we go over back to Ghidra and we pretend we don't have that source code. So I just went to the source code to kind of inform somebody who is not familiar with C++ about a feature of C++. But pretend that you knew that being yourself a C++ knowledgeable developer who is doing reverse engineering. So you already knew that. I was explaining it to you just now because maybe you're new to it. So as part of the tutorial, we went over to this, but we're pretending that we don't have the source code to the problem that we're working with with Ghidra here, right? So just keep that in mind. Those paradigms are kind of important and let your mind know these things so you can maximize how your mind will be trained and learn as you go through this lesson. So going back to this, this count line is outputting hello. And this count line right here is outputting, well, there's no string there. There's just this variable. And that variable contains the string that we type in. I'm going to come back to that in a second. I just want to go to the next line. This line here is actually uh, outputting this string right here. So let's go back over to the source code for a second. Notice how this line has count and the insertion operator. So less than lesson is the C++ insertion operator. And that's a way when we use it with count, uh, we can use it in different ways. But generally speaking, when you're using it with something like count, you're telling the stuff on the right to go to or be inserted to the stuff on the left. So you have console output, which is like an object that can send things to the terminal terminal so the user can see them. And the things on the right, which in this case is hello, are going to go to that thing. But notice how these are chained together. So you have insertion operator string, insertion operator, and then the variable where the name is, and then insertion operator, and then the rest of that string. Well, notice how Ghidra splits that across three different lines when it shows it to you. You can see here that there's an operator being called, and it has here a count ex ref, right? And you might be wondering, well, why isn't it just count? Remember, the linker and the compiler do all of this fancy stuff. And what they end up creating on the output might be more esoteric than what you see as a developer when you're using C++ directly. Just keep that in mind. So Ghidra is just using the symbols that were available in that symbol file. And those symbols might have different names. They might not match exactly what was in the original file because that's part of the feature of what the compiler and the linker do is they do certain things that require different names some sometimes, right? So how they map things from what the developer, you know, uses and sees within a source file, how they map those things to the binary file might be very different in terms of the names that are used and things like that. Just keep that in mind. And notice that they have this PB uh, var here and notice how that gets chained over to the next uh, call. So you see the PB var is passed here and the PB var is passed here. Now we're not going to get into the details of that right now because it's not essential. What I want to focus on is this variable being apparently the text that we type in. So what you can do in Ghidra when you begin to understand the program is you can give sensible names to the variables. So if I click on this local uh, variable that has kind of a funny name and I right click on it, I can rename it uh, by clicking on rename variable. Now, one thing I'd recommend is notice that there's a character here called L. That's an accelerator. And and that is a shortcut that will let us just type the letter L and we'll do the rename. So let me just show you. If I right click on here and do rename, Ghidra shows you this box here where you can rename it. I'm going to hit cancel and I'm just going to put my cursor on the variable and I'm going to hit the L key and the same box comes up. So I recommend when you're learning Ghidra and you want to become fast at it, like and learn the shortcuts. You right click the menu. If you see what it is you want, there's nothing wrong with using your mouse and clicking a menu. But if you've done that quite a bit and you want to get to be a little faster, basically look on the menu and see if there's an accelerator or shortcut for it. And if you see L there, you can dismiss the menu and don't use that option. This is a way of training yourself. Then go and highlight the variable and hit the L key and you can bring that up. So you could do either way. You can use the menus if you want to, but this is a good 
thing to get used to early and you've probably already done it if you've used any kind of fancy like editing software or something you've probably learned the shortcuts and it's a very common technique for somebody to go to the menu see what the shortcut is don't use the menu then use the shortcut by getting you know making the menu go away after you've learned what the shortcut is and then you you know use the shortcut and it's a way of getting you used to using the shortcut as opposed to getting used to using the menu okay so we're going to call this variable i'm going to call this variable um uh, name name I'll call it name value okay or name we can call it name string I'll call it name value because if you're used to if you're new to C++ this will make more sense to you this variable right so when I oh by the way look what happened I'm gonna hit undo now look at up here name value is appearing up here I'm gonna hit undo and notice how it went back to the old variable and notice how all those got renamed back as well so this is a very important part about reversing as you start to understand the puzzle it's like a puzzle you know when you put together a puzzle and it's very difficult like those thousands of piece puzzles with the small pieces and the colors are very esoteric and you're piecing it together you might be dealing with the flowing water in a water fountain and it might be very hard to oh does this go with this and this but then you start to solve little pieces to the puzzle and it starts to roll like a snowball and you get faster and faster as you start to figure things out same thing with logic problems if you've ever done those logic problems you begin to find little pieces of information out and you just start somewhere where you can get a footing and from that footing you go and you figure out like hey you know what what do you know what am I learning as I go so in this case we're pretty confident this is the name value so I'm gonna hit the L key here and I'm gonna call this name value now before I hit enter notice up here where that same variable is like right there and right there notice it's gonna change all of those you see so for figuring out that one little piece of the puzzle we got some other pieces figured out and that's kind of the fun thing about reversing is you start to figure out out this world and let me tell you I I once did a capture the flag uh, not long ago that had this uh, you know it, it was I wouldn't call it the toughest reversing problem but it took time and effort to go through it because there were there was a puzzle to figure out it was fun but it was arduous as well because I had you know you had to go into it and figure little things out and as you figured those things out it lets you go to like another level there's like levels in reversing it's not like they are levels that are laid out by anybody as part of an official game they're sort of implied as you advance on the journey and it's almost like you're in this adventure world so there's kind of a video game aspect to it on some level or and you know what is those mo mmorg uh, it slips uh, you know the the little textual event adventure things right so now we're pretty sure that this thing is the name variable so let's see within this function that we're in which is main so i'm going to scroll back up you see here's main let's go and see where else in this function name values used now what we can do is right click on name value go down to secondary highlight and choose set highlight and it shows us basically all these values now look here we see that it's a, a an stl string so if you're uninitiated with c plus plus you're not going to know what basic string but basically all you have to know is that's a variable that can hold a value like a name or a word or a sentence or a huge paragraph you know uh, sky's the limit it's up to the amount of memory you have now if we go back to the source code now remember you don't have access to the source code but i'm now in that mode of talking to the people who might not know C++ and so we're peeking at this to learn a little bit about C++ but let's pretend the rest of it doesn't exist okay and we go over here and we see that there's a thing called standard string username and that is the variable that we're looking at over there now notice it's named differently over there why is it named test value over there and it's named username here well we don't have access to the source code we only have access to what we're doing in Ghidra so as people who are doing reverse engineering over there in Ghidra we can come up with a name you can come up with any name you want to we could have typed in username but let's just pretend you know we don't have the source code we're just coming up with a name that we find helpful as people doing reverse engineering in Ghidra and this is something that each person who learns to do reversing will develop their own little art and style and way of naming things and dealing with things and and you're, you're you will equally do the same thing notice also too that this is simply a, a, a string here now std string that stands for standard string 
string, which is a string from the standard library in C++. We're not going to get into that. Just keep in mind the way you could define an integer or a floating point value. You can also define strings. In most any computer language, they have strings. And in C++, it's no different. And you can define strings a number of different ways. Using the standard string from the standard library is one way. And it's a very easy way to work with strings. So notice in here, it's called basic string, not std colon colon string. There's a reason for that, and that's because that std, well, I can actually show you really quickly. If we put our cursor on here and I hit F12 on the keyboard, it's going to take me into the standard library. And when you're in the standard library, look at what it shows you. It shows you that string is really something called basic string. And that's because there's more than one kind of string in the standard library, but they all are kind of handled by this one thing called basic string. And that has to do with the versatility that the standard library gives you by using features in C++ that allow developers to be very versatile and how they create libraries. It's kind of an advanced topic or intermediate topic. It's something that you get into more as you use C++. So don't worry about this so much if you're not initiated with C++. Just get a taste for whatever you get as you go through this. So I'm going to hit control and minus to go back to the source code. That's just something in Visual Studio. You can hit F12 to go to some place and control minus to come back. Other editors environments will have similar things, but it might be different keystrokes and even Visual Studio can be configured with different keystrokes. So just keep that in mind that the default is F12 and control minus. Okay, going back to Ghidra. Now we put on our hat of being reverse engineering folks and we name this variable name value. We've never looked at that source code because we don't have access to it. And that's why we're in Ghidra right now is we don't have access to it, but we want to figure out how the binary works. There's somebody who has that source code and they built a binary, which we have, and we want to figure out how that binary ticks, what makes it work, what's going on in there that may not be evident on the surface when we use the binary, because when we use it from the command line, as you saw, it just prints out like, hello, whatever you type in. But we're reversing in Ghidra right now, and we see there's something, maybe something a little bit more going on here. So we basically see that this string called name value is being used in a lot of different places here. And we can go over this with a fine tooth comb, but what I'd rather do is let's look for the simple things that we see on the command line here. So like the first thing that it displays is please enter your full name. Let's run that again, right? Please enter your full name. So let's go over here to Ghidra and let's look for that. Well, here's the thing that says, please enter your full name. And let's see what's going on with that. Well, if you look, it's doing the it's doing that same thing here with Kout. Uh, it's calling Kout. And while it looks funny, compared to what we see in the source code, remember two things. The source code and the what's in the binary are going to be different because the compiler and the linker, and we don't have access to the source code. All we have is what's in the binary. And however, Ghidra can present that to us, and Ghidra will present it to us better and better as we give it more information as we pick apart the puzzle. Like we already figured out this name, so Ghidra can use that name and kind of makes it easy for us to kind of, you know, continue forward. So what we're seeing here is this thing here, outputs, please enter your full name. And then look at the next line. It has a thing here, get line. Whoops. I didn't mean to actually go to uh, get line. Uh, I went forward by hitting a uh, double click. If you do that by accident, you can go to the arrow key up here to go back. But in the spirit of learning shortcuts, look at the tool tip there. The tool tip says alt left to go back. So let's click the left arrow the first time. And we end up coming back to this main program on get line here. Let's double click on that again. We go to get line. That's the library function that reads a line from the terminal, from the user who's going to enter it at the terminal. And instead of hitting the left button here, we're going to go Alt and left arrow. Okay, Alt and left arrow is going to take us back. What I just did there is a way of exercising in my mind what the shortcut is. So here is getLine and look what getLine is doing. GetLine is passing in this variable called name value. So it looks like it's asking the terminal, hey, give me something the user types and it's putting that into the variable name value, which is a standard C++ string. And then what does it do after that? Oh my gosh, 
look on the next line. There's something very interesting on the next line. Now, remember, we don't have the source code, right? Now, you might have peeked at the source code and already saw this, but let's pretend that we didn't do that. Well, look what's happening here. There's a thing here called BVAR. Now, it's common practice in C and C++, not everywhere, but in many different uh, areas where, you know, like certain companies might do this or certain kinds of projects, open source projects. It depends on the project and whatnot, but it's a common practice in certain circles to prefix a variable name with the small letter B as in Boolean if the variable is a Boolean value. So notice this says BVAR1 equals something, and we'll get into that in a second. So what is BVAR1? Well, BVAR1 is some kind of of Boolean variable. What it's doing here is it is saying, we see here is there's a thing here called operator not equals. So in C++, um, let's go back to the source code, but remember we don't have the source code. We're just going back there to learn about C++ really quickly. In C++, there's an operator called not equals, which is exclamation equals. That means if username is not equal to this string here, then go and do what's in here. Other Otherwise, if it is equal to this string, it won't go do what's in here. It'll skip this and continue down here. Let's go back over here. We see that here it is setting BVAR to the result of operator not equals against name value, which is the string. It's kind of hard. If you don't know C++, it might be hard to understand this, but when you're checking for equality or for not equals with a C++ string, it ends up actually calling a function to perform the operations needed to determine if something is equal or not equal. What is going on here is this function called operator not equal is being called with two parameters. One parameter, which is called an operand, is name value, which is the variable that contains the text that you type in at the terminal or the user. The other string is this interesting string it has text in it that says Lador de back. Well, that's interesting. I see the word back and door. It makes me think back to, oh, the door of back. Back door. Could this be a back door? I think this might be a back door. Let's look carefully. So what happens here when operator not equals is called with these two values? Well, these are two operands. One operand is on one side of the not equal sign, and the other one is on the other side. One is on the right side, one is on the left side. And it's basically saying, is name value not equal to Lador de back? Well, if it is not equal to Lador de back, that is true. So if this value is not equal to this value, that would be true or a one. If this value is equal to this value, but the operator is a not equals operator. So not equals wants to see things that are not equal to be true. So for a not equals operator, if they're both identical, it would be false. So the variable bvar gets a one, for true, if those two values are not equal to each other, it gets a true. If they are equal to each other, or if you type in at the command line, la door de back, then bvar is going to be zero or false. Well, we're going to try this though right away. We see this, la door de back. I want to try typing that in on the command line. We're going to do that in a second. But what happens here if bvar, well, let's try it actually. Let's try typing this in. Let's go here, la door the back. Ooh, it says, very good. Please do tell me a secret, will you? Well, there's something more to this executable. It was doing more than just wanting to tell us to have a good day. It's really good we're reverse engineering this. There might be something going on here. I don't know. Uh, we come back over here. So what, what's happening here is when we type in Lador de back, we get back very good. Please do tell me a secret, will you? Okay, let's look at what happens here. Where do we see that? Well, we see here, I hope you had a great day. Hello, name value. I hope you had a great day. When does that happen? That happens if 
BVAR in C++, if you have an if statement and you say if and something which is non-zero, like one, which is true, if you say if and a non-zero value, that's the same thing as saying if true, then do something. Otherwise, you won't do that thing. So this is like saying if BVAR is one or if BVAR is non-zero, and it will be non-zero if the value that was entered by the user is not equal to Lador the back and frankly that matches what we see in the behavior of the application because if if it is not equal to Lador to back the thing just says hello name value I hope you have a great day and it it says goodbye and that's it it's all over after that in fact we can actually see that if bvar is non-zero do this and then there's an else statement now this else statement is what happens if bvar is false let's skip that for a second and go to the bottom here so we're going to go down down here now this else statement is part of what goes on in this else statement so it's nested so we're going to skip all that and if you go to the bottom here you'll notice it just exits so what happens is if bvar is true meaning name value is not equal to the door the door the back if if name value if the thing that the user enters now by the way something we can do here watch what we can do here most disassemblers uh, reverse engineering tools will, will help you do this we're learning that um, well bvar first of all is basically saying if it's not equal to like a back door so I'm gonna rename this variable so uh, I forgot what that shortcut is so I'll right click oh rename variable is L so I'm gonna dismiss the menu I'm gonna highlight bvar and I'm gonna type in L and I'm going to keep B there for Boolean, but I'm going to name this to something that makes more sense. And I'm going to, I'm going to call this B is not back door because it's saying if it's not equal to the back door string, then set this variable to true. So this true, I'm going to, uh, this variable, I'm going to call this B is not back door. Okay. And now it even makes a little more, more sense now. So you can put uh, the cursor at the beginning of this if statement that we understand now, and you can right click and you can see here that you can put a pre comment and in the pre comment, you can put any human readable text you can say if the user did not enter the back door string dot 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 meaning go into this if statement here and see now you get a nice little human readable thing that shows you you know kind of what the human meaning of this is and and as you reverse engineer stuff you'll start adding more and more stuff like this and you'll develop your own system for how you name variables when you decide to put comments and stuff most of the time when I'm reversing something as soon as I learn little factoids little things about I'll start naming things and another thing about reversing is don't be afraid to name something I'm I very often will start with names that have the best meaning that I can guess as to what a value or a variable means. And then I might realize later on, oh, that's not the such and such, that's actually this. So I'll go back and rename something to make more sense. And you see, that's the iterative art of reversing in, in part, at least, is this idea of you name things, you, you figure out the puzzle. Think about that puzzle we talked about where you arrange the pieces and you might arrange certain colors over here and this, and then you discover later, oh, no, 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 that's the mountain and and that's the field. I thought that was the mountain before, but it's the color I was mixing it. So there's this whole thing of figuring things out and arranging things and then going back and rearranging. And it's like an iterative thing. Now, what we're really waiting for here is what happens if it is the factor, right? Well, because we see something happened here, right? This thing wants a secret from us. Well, let me just type in secret. And it says, no code was found. There are no more features in this program. Thank you for stopping by and uh, have a nice day now, exclamation. Uh, copyright the Brotherly Institution Incorporated. If there's anything named that, this is no relation. That's supposed to be jokey, funny, haha. -ha. And uh, that's about that. Okay. All right. So what do we do here now? Well, let's go look to see what happened here? Well, we entered in this apparent backdoor string and it said very good and it wanted to know a secret. Well, let's just go here where it says, you know, it's not a backdoor and then that one exits. We already know that. So we go here to the else here and let's examine, let's, let's examine this else portion here because that's where it seems like some meat and potatoes has taken place. Or if you're vegan, you know, tofu and, um, 
sauteed asparagus. This says very good. And then it says, tell me a secret, will you? Well, that's kind of interesting. And it seems to be um, doing an input here. This is sin, C-I-N, which is console input. Remember the uh, ones that send stuff to the console is count console out, but sin is accepting something and that's actually connected with get line. So there's a get line being called and it seems to be putting the result of whatever the user enters into this variable called local 190. By the way, we can actually remove our secondary highlight. So we can remove that right now because we don't really need that one for name right now. So it says here, please do tell me a secret, will you? And it's doing a get line into this variable. So you know what I'm going to do and I think it's L to rename the variable. So I'm going to say L to rename a local variable, L for local. So let's call this secret string. Okay. Because we kind of know that that's, you know, that's where a secret is going into from get line. Now what happens with that afterwards? Well, there's a function on string and let's put on our, we are learning C++ hat. Let's go back to the source code. Now remember, we don't have access to source code. We're going here just to learn something about C++ really quickly. This function here, so here's the secret string, right? And this is a function on a C++ string that will return something called a pointer. And that pointer, it, think of it as a value that is the address of where the string is located in memory. And with that address, code or functions can actually process that string. So if the user is prompted to enter a secret and the user types in like hello or secret like we just typed in. So let's go, let's go over here. So if you type in secret here, right, that string secret goes into this variable called user secret. Well, as people putting our reverse engineering hat on, um, we don't know that that that's the name of the variable, but we kind of are inferring that simply because there seems to be a backdoor in here. And that backdoor seems to give us the ability to enter in a secret, which ends up in this variable. Notice how this variable is then, you know, this secret has its C stir called, which returns a pointer. So that's analogous to this. So just keep that in mind because I want to show you that that pointer is this PC var2. So this PC var2 ends up getting the result of what Cster returns. So Cster returns something here. We are peeking at the source code. We know it gets passed to this function as an argument, but with our reverse engineering hat on and without the source code, we don't know that. So let's go back over here and see how we can see that from the Ghidra side of things. From the Ghidra side of things, you have Cster actually returning that pointer value and putting it into PC var. And uh, we can actually call that a secret string pointer. Let's call it that. So I'm going to hit L and I'm going to type in secret string pointer. And the way to think of, you know, well, what's the difference between secret string and, and the pointer? Aren't they both the string? And kind of, but uh, we could equally, we could have written this code differently where we would have passed this string, uh, this, this thing, secret string directly to that function. But in some cases, there's code that uses something called a C string. Think of a C string as just a simple number value that has the address inside of secret string where the actual physical data that represents the string exists. You know, if you type in hello123, hello123 is inside of this thing, which is secret string. Now, secret string is an instance of a string variable. And so it's, it's an object and it has more meat and potatoes, right? It has more tofu and veggie docs, right? It's got more stuff kind of going on. In, in other words, it has more functionality. With, with, with a secret string, you can do a lot more stuff. You can, you can do special searching. You can use algorithms on it. It's, it's, it's kind of a robust object, right? Uh, secret string pointer is just a value that we asked for. We, we asked secret string, hey, give us the address inside of you where the physical characters of the string exist. We don't want to do anything more. We just want that number that has the address because we're going to do something with that character string and we don't need the rest of you. We don't need secret string and all the fancy stuff you can do. We just want that number with that address of where that text is located in the computer's memory. Okay, secret string pointer. All right. Uh, so 
So we have this pointer value, which is an address. And what happens? Well, there's a function that we call here called get the code. And what gets passed to get the code? Well, that number, uh, the location of the secret string you're reversing and you come across as you're really anxious. What's going on inside get the code? And by the way, get the code has something that it gets back. We don't really know what it gets back. My guess is it gets back a code of some kind, but we don't know yet. I tell you what. What you can do is put your cursor on here and you can hit the enter key. And when you do that, you're going to jump to that function. Let's repeat something here. Remember before we went back to where we came from. How did we do that? Well, if you forget, go look up here on the toolbar and you'll see a back arrow. And that back arrow is go to previous location. But it also has an accelerator of alt and left. So we can click this toolbar button and we'll go back to where we were. Let's put our cursor on that. It already is and hit enter and we jump to that location. Let's use the alt and the, uh, and the left arrow. Alt left arrow. We jump back to that location. So we have enter to go. Oops. Enter. Uh, something happened here. Okay. I didn't put the cursor on the thing. So we put the cursor on here and like hit enter. Now we go alt and left arrow to go back. And you can buy it. By the way, you can double click and you jump to the location. Alt left arrow, go back. Why is this important? Part of reversing is learning how to navigate around. And sometimes you got a gnarly bunch of variables going on in your head. Oh my God, you're reversing all these different sections and trying to bring things together, right? That's different from the simpler cases. We're kind of going through a simple case right now. You got all this stuff going on in your head and it's like, you know, you need to move around. Alt left, enter, do, hit L, rename a variable, left, that's that. You, you don't want to spend your brain cycles, which are acting as like your brain is kind of like DDR3000 or something, right? I'm making that up, right? I know there is no DDR3000, so it's DDR5, right? I'm jumping way ahead because human brain, right? But it's like this, like we're, we're refreshing all the time, right? Like we, we don't want a lot of things interrupting us. We got all these variables and we're trying to solve a problem, right? And so these, just these reverse engineering tools, they try to give you all these things where you just, you touch a key, you touch this, you do that, and it does that for you, right? Uh, it's not like you can't use menu stuff or whatever, but just keep that in mind. You want to be able to navigate around. So we're going to put our mouse cursor on that. We're going to hit enter. We're going going to jump to this function. Let's look at this function. What is this? Well, look, param1, Ghidra could only come up with some kind of interesting, you know, sort of like name for it called param1, right? Like it kind of comes up with something that, you know, is somewhat human readable, but it doesn't have a logical meaning yet. But we already know what's passed to that. Let's go alt left arrow and go back, right? Oops, sorry. I have to be in, in here in this window, I think, and then hit alt left arrow. Okay, great. So what is it that we're passing? secret string pointer. Well, guess what? I'm actually just going to copy this. Okay. Control C. All right. So now I'm going to put the cursor there, hit enter to jump to here. I'm going to highlight that. I'm going to hit L because I know that that's going to rename param. I'm going to paste in the same name because I want to call it the same thing in this function. Boom. Like that. Two seconds, right? Uh, it's more than two seconds because I'm talking, but when you're working on stuff, you're going to, you're, you're just going to be like, okay, that's secret string. You know. Okay. So what's going on in here? All right, so, um, well, uh, there is something called the big secret. Bum, bum, bum. Okay. Hey, folks, it's a few hours later, and I needed to get a little bit of rest. So we're going to resume here. So forgive if anything looks a little bit different, but it is a few hours later. And uh, that's it. I just wanted to mention that. Okay, so we've renamed this to secret string pointer, or PTR, and that's a care pointer. Uh, and uh, we're going to explain some of this in a second here. Okay, so let's try to understand what's going on in here. So we know that this is a parameter being passed to this function. This is the address that points to the first character. From that address, you can not only get to that first character, but you can get to the next one and the next one and the next one. So let me actually, let's, why don't we whiteboard that really quickly? Okay, so here's where that function's called, and it's called with a secret string pointer, and remember that secret string pointer comes from from the basic string or the standard C++ string, which was named secret string. And that contains the string um, that the user enters at the command line. All right, so let's go back to the command line. Let's run this and we'll type in Lador de back. That gives us access to the back door. And now it says, please do tell me a secret. So if I say my 
my guess, right? Just M-Y-G-U-E-S-S, -S, and I hit enter. Okay, so what happens when I type in my guess? Let's grab secret string, and let's bring it over to our little notepad whiteboard here. We're gonna go up here, and we're gonna grab secret string. So basically, this is a C++ string. When I enter in my guess, it's almost like we are assigning to secret string the, the string my guess. So this is the line right here. In fact, why don't we just grab that line and uh, let's put that right here. So this is the line in the disassembly, which shows that we're using get line to take something from the console input and it's being put into secret string. When we enter in my guess, it ends up assigning it like this almost in a sense, right? Uh, what's actually happening is when I type a character, that character is being received from the console IO. What happens really is if I type a character like M, that gets accepted by the console and that character gets put into the buffer and then the next character comes in and that goes into the buffer. But after all that happens and I press enter, it's like as if the net result is as if the string my guess gets assigned to secret string. Okay, so simple enough so far, right? So then the next thing that we see happen here is, um, the next thing we see happen is this, and I'll just bring this over here as well. Okay, so what's happening here is there's a pointer value which is being assigned uh, the result of calling C underscore STR on the object secret string. So that's analogous to the C++ code, you know, as if I were to do this. It's almost sort of similar to doing this right here, okay? So basically, but when you look at normal C code, the way that it looks in the binary when you're looking at it, you know, when you're looking at it with a tool like Girda, uh, what you're gonna see is more of the low level representation of things. So you're gonna see things in a more raw format where it's not gonna quite look like C code. And that's because it's using, maybe there's gonna be some different symbols and things in there. The way that it gets represented in the final, you know, binary and the way you're looking at it is, it's just gonna have an arrangement that's more optimum for the machine and the way the binary gets constructed and how it executes and how it interacts with other memory such that the way you look at things you know basically like when we look at it in the, in the in the disassembler there in Girda what you're seeing is it's calling a function called cster and it's passing it the address of something called secret string and really if you're familiar with C++ this is the this pointer okay so this is calling a C++ method and it's passing the method the this pointer because the this pointer and when I say this what I mean is the this pointer that always exists whenever you call a function so in a sense whenever you call any method of basic string there's going to be a pointer called this and the type of that pointer is going to be a basic string pointer and that that pointer is a pointer to itself. Well, I could actually write itself, but like in Python, if you're familiar with Python, that is referred to as self. And in C++, they call it this. So these are just different names for a pointer or a reference, if you will, depending on the language and the certain context. That pointer is a pointer to the object itself. So this brings up another good point that even if you don't want to reverse engineer, it can be helpful to play around with Girda and maybe even look at your own binary that's been and compiled because you will develop better chops as a software developer and somebody who can really get hands-on with debugging tough lower level problems that can very often come into play when you're working with native code but even higher level code and the stronger chops you have the more you'll be able to maybe pick apart what's kind of going on there that's causing a problem and part of being able to do that is understanding you know what's going on here when you see a function like this being called so basically C++ code like this is sort of roughly equivalent to what you see in Girda. In fact, you know, I wouldn't even say roughly equivalent. Girda has that representation of, of it. And, you know, all these things are pretty much like symbolic ways of representing something. So when you look at C++ source code, you're usually looking at a very pure representation of what the software looks like. So you might see this in C++, secret string dot C stir, right? So that's calling this function, this method, this member function of the secret string um, variable, which is really whatever the variable is. And in this case, the variable secret string 
actually happens to be a basic string, or we might just say an STL string. So what's really going on in C++ when you make a call like this is you're actually calling this function of basic string and you're passing it one parameter and that parameter happens to be the variable itself. That's the this pointer or the self pointer if you're familiar with Python. So the interesting thing about this is if you're used to working in high level languages like Python or C++ and you go over to Girda and you start poking around in there, you start to learn a little bit more um, about what's really going on under the hood. And actually, there, you know, a lot of C++ developers might know generally that this is what's going on, but when you actually see the representation of it in Girda, it can galvanize that understanding a little bit more strongly than maybe you might have had prior to looking at Girda, where you understood conceptually what was happening there, but you're actually actually kind of seeing the low-level code, the representation. And this is actually, you know, geared at decompiled code, but it has an accuracy to it. You actually might say it has a little bit more of a true or lower level representation than this, because what we see here, there, you know, this is a symbolic representation that means what this expresses. Now, this is also a symbolic representation. We can break this down further into assembly language and we can get into that. It'll either be later in this tutorial or another tutorial, but let's just take it one step at a time. The whole point I'm trying to make here is when you look at things in Girda, in order to understand them, you should kind of keep this in mind that you're kind of seeing things that you would see in C++, but you're seeing them with a different symbolic representation overall. And there's a couple of different ways that can happen. You might be looking at the assembly language disassembly. You might be looking at pseudo code from a decompile in Girda, as we're looking at here. And uh, they all, all those different paradigms have value and being able to recognize them and interpret them can be very helpful. And I, I'm of the personal belief that like if you're interested in C++ development and you're interested in that lower level software development, diving into this kind of stuff is extraordinarily fruitful. And uh, I, I would say that it, it's really something like, I don't think you'd want to be without if you really kind of want to be strong with that lower level stuff of what's going on on under the hood. But even if you don't want to spend tons of time under the hood, you're just going to work with C++ and, and you know, the higher level, you know, language stuff and debugger stuff and whatnot. That's fine. But you also may want to just like dip in there a little bit to kind of see a little bit what's going on. So you don't have to, you know, get married to the notion of mastering everything in here, but getting a little peek at it and having an understanding of the gist of it can come in handy maybe if you're debugging a tough problem one day or you want to look at something under the hood and it won't be as foreign to you. You know, I can kind of recommend looking at stuff under the hood like this for a number of different paradigms, a number of different archetypes of individuals, you know, approaching this. It doesn't have to be somebody who wants to do reversing or malware analysis, for example. Okay, so I like to reset after explaining things like that and just kind of go over over it again, sort of like a repetitive thing a little bit, because I think if you're watching this, it can kind of help that. So here, here's what we're doing. We have this function here. Um, we kind of gone, went over some of this. We know if we enter Lador to back, okay, this thing will actually not be true. It'll be false, which will cause us to come and run this else statement here. Th this says very good. And then it says, and then it says, please do tell me a secret, will you? And then it prompts for a secret, which ends up going into secret string. So if we type in my guess at the command line, it's almost equivalent to taking the string my guess and putting it inside of secret string. And secret string is a basic string. So it's, it's like taking a basic string string that we've declared to be secret string and putting the string that the user types at the command line in our example right now, it's the string my guess. So that goes into the memory that maintains this object secret string. Okay. Then there's a function that gets a pointer to the first character in that string. And that's what this code does. So that's equivalent to this C++ code right here ends up looking something like this under the covers where you're calling this function, a basic string called C underscore stir. Now C underscore stir returns a C string. I'm actually going to change what we're doing here just really quickly. And I'm going to say Lador de back. And then the secret that we're going to enter is ABC. Okay. And it says no code found, right? So we're going to change this here to be ABC and you'll see why. Okay.
ASCII table. We're going to look for an ASCII table and we'll go here and let's look for the code ABC. So here's ABC and the hexadecimal codes for ABC are going to be 61, 62, and 63 in hex. Those are very easy for us to recognize. 61, 62, 63. Okay, we're going to go back over here to our pseudo whiteboard and uh, I changed this from my guess to ABC because it's going to be easier for me to explain this. Uh, when you type in ABC in memory, you have 61, 62, and 63. This function here, cstr, the way that the C++ library defines a basic string C underscore stir is it defines it such that when you call this, you're going to get a pointer to the first character, which is going to be 61 or uh, the letter A. So this secret string pointer is going to end up pointing to the first character and I'm actually going to go and put this. Okay, so after this call right here, this value, this secret string pointer is going to have the address, which is a number, and that number is going to be the memory location that has the first character of the string that the user entered from the command line, which is going to be A or 0x61. The next one is going to be 0x62, which is B, and 0x63, which is C. Now, this function has in its document documentation. So if we go here and type in C++ string C stir, we should get like CPP reference or C++ one of these two. So if you go here, you can see the documentation here has C stir and this will return a pointer to an array that contains a null terminated sequence of characters that represents the current value of the string object. So in order for this function to be performing correctly, for it to be doing its job, correctly, it must return a pointer or an address value that points to the string, which means it points to the first character, but then the address that's right after the first character is the next character, and the address after that is the next character, and I'll, I'll show you what I mean by that. Uh, but it also means that there's going to be a null or a zero at the end of the string. This is referred to as a null terminated string. So let's be really simplistic here. Let's say that this string is in location 100, right? Now that's not usually like a, an address, usually the addresses are really large on like 64-bit platforms. Let's not get into all that because conceptually it's the same thing. Okay, let's just say it's at address 100. What that means is at address 100 is the byte 61 and that's the letter A. And at address 101 is the uh, character B and address 102 is the character C. Okay, and the C++ standard says when you call this, you will get a pointer to that first character, which really is a pointer to the whole string, but the pointer itself, which is an address, always points to the beginning of the string, which is the first address of the whole string. So what I'm suggesting here is that in our little pseudo example, after this function call right here, you would get back secret string pointer, okay? It would be equal to the value 100, which is the address of the first character, that this pointer that you get back that points to the first character. It's going to actually be pointing to the whole string. So the next address is going to have the next character. The next address is going to have the next character. And finally, at the end of that string, there's going to be a zero byte, which is what they refer to as a null terminator. And these kind of strings, actually in the C language, like ANSI C, like this is the way that strings used to be always represented. You didn't have all these fancy objects of C++ before C++. So people who've worked in C for many years are very familiar with these kinds of strings, okay? So what this line is doing is it's calling uh, the cstr function on the secret string object and it's asking it for a pointer to the first character of the string and, it, and that's supposed to be a null terminated string. So basically secret string pointer is the address of the first character of the string and it's a null terminated string. And then that null terminated string of what the user entered gets passed to get the code. So now we're gonna go in to get the code here. So here we are in this function and we can see that secret string pointer is passed here. We've already named this variable uh, to be the name that matches what the parameter is because we already are kind of familiar with what that means. This is a pointer to the first character that the user entered on the command line. And what it means is the address of the next character follows that address and so forth. So really that's a pointer to the entire string and it's a null terminated string. When we come in here, there's a thing called the big secret. Quick insert here, folks. This function takes a parameter 
parameter secret string pointer, which is the address pointing to the first character that the user entered. This function also contains a label, the big secret, which is an address to data already within this binary. Ideally, the parameter to this function would have been named something like user secret pointer or something to indicate that it was from the user. This will become more clear in a few moments, but I wanted to clarify this up front in case it helps. When we come in here, there's a thing called the big secret, okay? If we hit enter on big secret, we can see over here this changes and it shows us that big secret is an array that's in memory. So it's like a pre-initialized array that's already in memory when we run the program. And, you know, we can kind of infer from the name that it contains some sort of secret. Now, we can actually copy and paste this here. We can select all this. And then we can right click and do copy special and you can select uh, byte string and click OK. And then you can go over here to notepad and we can paste this out here. We're going to call this whatever the name is, which is the big secret. The big secret is an address in memory. It's a it's a place in memory. So this is the label. This is the user friendly label that was given to this uh, area of memory that contains this data. So if you're referring to the big secret, you're referring to the address of the first uh, byte, which is DE. But if you increment this to the next byte location, the next address, you'll be referring to this. And so in a sense, this points to the start of some sort of array in memory of these bytes right here. OK, so if we look at this line, if we go back over here, if we see local 170 equals the big secret, well, you can see here local 170 is defined as a uCare pointer. So it's equivalent to kind of saying this uCare pointer local 170 equals the first character in the big secret. So basically local 170 also points to the same thing that this label does. So what we know is that this function is for whatever reason setting up a pointer to some existing area of memory. Now very often that might happen in a C or C++ function because that function is going to do something to that area of memory and that's what's going to happen here. So we kind of know that this is a pointer to the big secret. I have my cursor on local 170. I'm going to hit the L key and type in P big secret uh, care and P is nomenclature which means pointer. So if you have a little P there it means this is a variable which is a pointer and then you name it. So this is a pointer to big secret care. Character. Normally in a C++ application, there's one particular naming convention for variables that's used generally throughout the application. You can see in Ghidra, it uh, uses a mixture of snake casing and Hungarian notation. We used snake casing for the parameter secret string pointer, PTR meaning pointer. It's a pointer to a character that is the beginning of the secret string. For Hungarian notation, you prefix the variable with some characters that indicate something about the variable, like its type or its meaning. So in this case, P means pointer, B means byte, for example. So PB var is pointer to byte, and we're naming it var1. PC var2 means pointer to character, and we're naming the variable var2. You could have pointer to character PC username, or PC password, or any other descriptive name. The key thing with Hungarian notation is you're prefixing the variable with some kind of typing information or meaning information. There's different forms of Hungarian notation. You can actually look on Wikipedia at all of these styles to read more about them and their history. Generally speaking, even though there's a mixture of things that we're using here and that Ghidra is using here, even if Ghidra is using a mixture of notations, you might want to use one particular style for the sake of organization. Or you may choose to mimic what Ghidra does in a particular area in order to maintain some level of consistency consistency with uh, its approach. What you do is up to you, but obviously with any of this stuff where there's a lot of variables in play, and I mean that both actually and metaphorically, for example, pen testing or bug bounty hunting or programming in a large application system or project, all of these areas of work involve lots of brain cycles, tracking lots of variables and information. So the more organized you are, the more your brain can focus on the problem space rather than the lack of organization or lack of of 
consistency with how you choose to maintain information you're tracking as you work on the problem space. So this, this right here, the big secret is a label to a location in memory where that label represents the address of the first character of that table, which is the big secret. When you assign that to another variable, that other variable is going to have that same address. So in some sense, they're both sort of the same thing. One is a label that already exists that represents the start of that table. The other one is a variable you're creating, which will point to the same location as that table. But when you refer to both of those symbols, they kind of currently at this point in time, they both reference the same location in memory in a sense. So we can actually take this new name that we have and you can see it changed it up here. So in a sense, now that would change to something a little bit more user friendly where we have a uh, big secret care equals the big secret. Okay, so let's go see how this is being used. Well, we can see there's a for loop here and this for loop runs and does something and then after it does a check here and the check says uh, if this is zero then go and do this otherwise go down here and exit and return to the caller so before we look at the for loop let's actually jump down to this simple code here just to kind of see what it does sometimes I do that when I'm reversing you just kind of go to some simple areas because if you solve those it might help you figure out some of this other stuff up here and maybe not but it doesn't really matter you know, if you just spend a couple seconds going down here, you know, we may decide not to work on this area down here. We may just decide to come back up here, but let's just skip down here and look at this really quickly. Now, what we see is there's a variable called PC var2 and it's being assigned zero or null. So whenever you see zero like this in a, like a disassembly, um, that could mean the same thing as null when you look at C++. So for example, in C++, null pointer is equal to zero in a sense. And in fact, the standard allows you to use zero. Zero is a valid way. If you were to say care pointer p equals zero or care pointer p equals null pointer, uh, these amount to the same thing. In both cases, you're creating a new pointer and you're setting that pointer up with a value that initially is the null pointer, which means kind of that it's not assigned to anything. What zero or null generally means when you're assigning it to a pointer like this is that it hasn't been used yet. It's not pointing to a valid location in memory. What this is doing is it's assi assigning zero to something called PC var2, and then this is returning PC var2. We can see PC var2 up here is a care pointer, okay? So it's a pointer to some character in memory. And we can see that this particular case here assigns zero to PC var2 and then returns that zero. So we notice that this function, get the code, is supposed to return a care pointer. So it means whoever is calling this function is expecting back some sort of character pointer and one of the possibilities that the caller of this function needs to be prepared for is that this function can return a null pointer and that's not uncommon if you're familiar with C and C++ to have a function that might return a character pointer if something happens in a certain way and if something doesn't happen it might return a null pointer to indicate well this thing didn't happen or it wasn't successful or in some cases null pointer might mean success. It just depends on the defini definition of the function. And in this case, we don't really know exactly what it means, but we're figuring that out as we go. But one thing we know right off the bat is PC var2 is the return value. So we can put our cursor here and hit the L key and we can say P result. And what that means is that's the uh, return value to the caller of this function. And you can see that Girda renamed it. And you can also see here, there's some logic that's starting to bubble up. You can kind of see in this if clause at the bottom, it's setting the result to something which seems to be not zero. And we're seeing in this else clause here that it is uh, setting uh, the return value to be null or zero. So what we can see from this is that this else is going to return a null value. And we assume, it kind of seems like that this particular case here is going to return something not null. And it almost has a feeling like if things are successful, if you enter the right thing and it checks out, it's going to take this path right here, which is like the success path, and it will return something that's not null. So if we go back up to the if statement, we can see uh, it looks like things are successful if P 
big secret care equals zero, which is kind of interesting, right? Because we're just talking about nulls and whatnot, but this is a different thing than what we're talking about down here. So null is used in a lot of different ways. You can have a null pointer, which is an address in memory that is all zero, or you can have a null terminator at the end of a string, which is just one byte, which is zero, that just denotes the end of the string. So for example, this is a null at the end of this string of bytes, which seems to be the big secret. Null pointer or zero, if I take a, a pointer, just let's just make any old pointer, p, and I say zero, this uh, p variable is a pointer, which is an address. So this is address zero assigned to p. Okay, whereas this right here is a single character that happens to be zero and it's at the end of a string. And that's because traditional C strings don't use zero in the middle of the string. So they can use zero to mark the end of the string. So if we go back to our other whiteboard here, you can kind of see this is an address. So you would assign an address into a pointer, right? But that address will point to one or more characters in this particular scenario, and it might end with a zero. And this zero is not an address, it's just a character, but its value is zero, which marks the end of the string ABC, okay? So let's bring this entire section into a notepad whiteboard, and let's kind of look at it for a second, right? So if we go here, we'll pop this in, and you can see uh, that we're assigning a big secret character equals the start of the string that's called big secret and that's uh, we have that over here that's this uh, cryptic looking string here that doesn't have any meaning to us right now and it's assigning the start of that and in fact we can bring this over here it'll just make life easier so let's just put this at the top here so this is the big secret and what we're doing is we're assigning P big secret care to point to that first character and then we have a for loop okay so the for loop has several things and we're going to break out these components here right now. It has this assignment and it has this check. If you're familiar with C++, then you already know what's going on here. But if, you, if you're not, I'm going to go over this here. I'm sort of making this look a little Pythonic. Maybe it'll help. So a for loop has the format where you have four and let's just say A, B, and C separated by colons. And then you have some statements right here. These statements may or may not be in braces, but let's not worry about that right now because Girda is putting them in braces here for us. So we're just going to use Use this format. So A is an initialization statement. So you can see that's the initialization statement. B is a condition statement. This one gets checked before each iteration of the loop. We're going to get into all this in a second. And this last one here, the C part right there, that is an expression. And that expression gets evaluated after each iteration of the loop before the conditional check. So here's the A part right here. This is going to be an initialization uh, of some kind. This B part right here is a condition, and you can notice they're all separated by semicolons. So this is a conditional check that will happen before each iteration of the loop. And then you have some sort of expression that takes place after each iteration of the loop. So basically the loop is going to go and initialize this. It's going to check this. And if this check is true, it's going to run what is in the parentheses or whatever the statement happens to be. That's this part. So it's going to do this at the very start. It's going to run this one time and one time only. Then before it loops, it's going to check this. If this is true, it'll run everything in here. Then after it runs everything in here, it'll run this part C. After it runs C, it'll perform this check again. If this check is true, it'll run this again. And it keeps doing that over and over again until this is false. So with that in mind, let's see what this for loop is doing that Ghidra has decompiled for us. Well, it's assigning local res 8 to be secret string pointer. So secret string pointer is what the user entered. Let's go back over to Ghidra. That's the parameter that we passed in. That's what the user entered at the command line. So we can actually go and get that from our little breakdown here. Let's actually get that and bring it over to our little pseudo whiteboard here. And we can actually just plug that in. In fact, I'll put this up here. That's what the that's the parameter to the function. That's what the user entered. This is some value that the function itself, the one that's verifying the code, it's aware of this 
this value and it's going to use this in some sort of processing that we're analyzing right now. And as part of this processing, it's set up this variable called big secret care to equal the address that this label represents. And then it begins this for loop. And this for loop starts out by taking this pointer that is to the first character of the user entered string and it assigns it to a variable called local res 8. So remember, this only executes one time. So at the initial start of the for loop, local res 8 points to the beginning of the user entered character string. This will not run anymore, this line. It only happens one time. Then the first thing that happens is there's a little check that takes place here. This little check basically has an asterisk here. And when you put this asterisk here in front of the variable that points to the address, which it points to this address. In fact, we can actually put this here and we can actually say that initially after that setup on the for loop, local res 8 points right here. Okay, so local res 8 points right here. When you refer to local res 8, you're referring to 100, which is the address of this location. When you put a little asterisk here, you're referring to what is inside that address, which is 61 or the letter A in this particular example. So this asterisk local res 8 at this particular point in time equals 61 or the letter A. Okay. Now, if you look here, this is using a similar asterisk. So if we refer to only P big secret care. So let's actually do the same thing. Here's big secret. So we're going to actually put this and let's say that this is at 200, even though it's not uh, really, we're going to say this is at 200. So we're going to say 202. So now I've broken this out. We have the user's input, which you're familiar with. Then we have the big secret. And we're, what we're saying to ourselves is the big secret is at location 200. So when we assign P big secret care to big secret, it actually is pointing to this address. So you can see a similarity here in the setup of these two. So if we're referring to just P big secret care, it actually is referring to this number 200, which is the address where the big secret points to. If we were to do something where you say asterisk and then P big secret care, you are referring not to 200, which is the address, but you're referring to what's in the address, which is DE. This alone is 200 and this with the asterisk is DE, okay? And same with this, this alone is 100. And if you put the little asterisk there and say local res 8, that is what is in that address of 100, which in this case is 61 or the character A. Okay, so we have all this broken down here. And if we come down here, you can see that this part of the for loop is basically saying only continue with this for loop if these two things are equal to each other. And on one side, it's saying the first character that the user entered, which is A, and the first big secret care, which is DE. So it's basically saying if 61 and uh, let me actually get 61 and put it down here for a second. So it's saying if 61 is equal to, and I'm going to do this wrong for a second just to make a point, if it's equal to DE, but it's not really doing that, right? So this is not right, but, but uh, hold on a second, hold on a sec, okay? So what it's really doing is there's more going on here. Okay, so let's actually copy and paste this up here. So what it's actually doing is saying the character which is within big secret care which is 0xde. Okay, so let's just replace that with 0xde. It's saying this exclusive ORD with this. So if we get out a programmer's calculator by starting calc on Windows and you can do an Alt 4 and that'll bring up a handy dandy programmer's calculator, you can actually go to hexadecimal and actually you can keep it at quad word, keyword, but you can also click this and it'll go to word and it'll go to byte. So now this is going to be a byte value. And if I type in DE, and then I think they have XOR here. Do they have XOR here somewhere? Oh, they do. So we'll type in XOR, and now we're going to type in AA, 
and we're going to hit enter. So 74, that equals 74. And what this is effectively doing, so this was wrong here, this interpretation of things. What that line of code is actually doing is saying, if 0x61 equals 0x74, then keep on looping, okay? So if you're analyzing this, you're wondering, well, what is 74? Let's go back over to our ASCII table and just see if it's an ASCII character. And it looks like, 74 hex is the character T, okay? So that's kind of maybe interesting. We don't know yet if it's gonna continue to be a bunch of characters. What we are seeing here, okay? And I'm gonna get rid of this thing which is wrong. And I wanna go back down here and I want you to see right here again, we're just gonna go over this one more time. This is saying the character which is in local res eight, that's the first character that the user entered on the command line. If that is equal to the big secret character that's currently being pointed to, which is the first one, XORD, with AA. So if what the user entered is equal to the big secret character XORD with AA, then keep on looping. The implication here is that the big secret character is encoded by exclusive OR with AA. You'll see exclusive OR used in, in code. Sometimes it's used with cryptography and uh, encoding things and whatnot. And it can be a way of kind of obfuscating bytes or encoding them in some kind of way. So in this case, Case, this is a very simple encoding algorithm. It seems that this big secret is encoded by exclusive oring all of its characters with the secret code AA. This is basically saying start at the first character that the user entered and then check to see is that character equal to the big secret XORD with AA? Decode the, the big secret character that we're currently checking. So decode this DE character by exclusive oring it with AA. And after you decode it, compare it with the first character that the user entered. If it is uh, equal, continue forward. Well, what does it do to continue forward? Well, it increments this pointer to point to the next value. And notice up here, this also increments local res to the next value, which is equivalent to incrementing to the next character. So what happens is if this is equal to this X or AA, the pointer will go to the next position and the same check will take place. And if those are equal, it'll go to the next one and the next one. And that'll continue until there is a mismatch. Now, a mismatch can happen in two different ways. One is if this character or this character, whichever one we're checking, is not equal to the big secret which is decoded with an XOR uh, of AA, or when it reaches the end. If it reaches the end of the string, the end of the string here, the big secret is gonna have zero, zero. And if you XOR that with AA, it's gonna be AA. And if this secret string pointer has equaled everything, um, it's actually not going to, it's, it's basically going to have uh, a value which is not AA. A, basically. So if we go back to Girda, what happens here is this is going to loop through the string and it's going to decode every single big secret uh, character by XORing each character with AA. So a good exercise for you to do if you're not familiar with this is to go through each of these characters. So start here and type in DE in the calculator, right? And then do XOR, right? And then do AA and then hit equals and you have 74. So what you can do is uh, we can actually copy this for our decoding, right? So we can actually uh, just copy this for a second so I can just show you what this exercise might look like if you do this. Okay, so you have the big secret and uh, what you can do is XOR, you want to XOR each of these with AA, right? So we could actually fill this in and you would just go down the list here like so. Okay, and the first one is 74. So you could put a 74 there. So so the next one would be C2 and you would say bitwise XOR and you would go AA and that would be 68. And you type in 68. And if you do that for all of those and then you go to the ASCII table, look up 74. So that's T. So we would put T. Or actually, I like to do that when we're talking C. Uh, and the next one is 68. So 68 is H. And this next one is CF. X or AA, so you say CF, X or AA, and that's gonna be 65. So if we go and, and get 65 off the table here, that's gonna be E, so we put 65 and E, and we say F5, X or AA, and we have 5F, 
So that's 5f. What is 5f? So we look in the table here. 5f is an underscore, okay? And basically, you, you can go down the entire list here. This is actually what that for loop is doing. It's going one by one, and it's saying, okay, decode this character, and did the user enter that? And did the user enter this? And the, the, did the user enter that? And the, you know, and so on and so forth. So with everything decoded, we can see that the big secret is the underscore big underscore secret. So what happens here is this thing is expecting the user to enter the big secret as the initial characters in whatever the user types in. What they type in after doesn't really matter as long as the initial characters are the big secret. So if the user enters in the big secret, that for loop is gonna go all the way to the end and it's gonna stop checking at the last character of the big secret, which is zero. But if the checks fail before that point in time, the pointer value p big secret care is going to point to something before the zero, which is going to be not zero. So if you go over here and you look at this for loop, you can see when it exits out here, if the character at the address p big secret care is zero, that indicates that the user entered at, at the very least the secret code. So what this means is if the user entered the secret code, go and do all of this in here. If they didn't enter the secret code, then go and just return uh, null to the caller. So we can actually put a comment in here by putting the cursor there and we can say if the user at least entered the secret code continue because we don't know what it's going to do just yet right and then there's our comment right there and then this right in here is probably going to decipher something it looks like it's actually decoding something else because if you look here there's another for loop and it's actually decoding something so we're not going to get into that because i'm going to tell you right now it's kind of decoding a similar string and that's the answer that gets displayed and the reason why it's encoded is so you can't just look at the raw binary file and see the string right so basically I, what I can do is I can just put a comment in here and you can look at that yourself if you want to uh, it's kind of the same thing as what we just went through so I'm gonna say decode the secret and return it to the caller so that's just a little comment that I'm gonna put in there and that's what goes on right here so basically what this function is doing is it's checking what the user entered if the user entered at least the secret code they can enter more but if but they have to at least have the secret code in the start of it if they entered at least the secret code this thing will return with a decoded string which is like the special code uh, if it doesn't it'll just return null so let's try entering in the secret code here so we will enter in uh, le door de back and then we'll type in the secret code so obviously I entered it wrong. Uh, so what is it? It's the, oh, it's the big secret. Okay, the big secret, the big secret, the big secret. Oh, uh, I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, le door de back, the big secret. Hey, there's a little flag, right? Okay, so anyway, uh, that, that part right here, this part right here is being decoded right in here, especially like right here. So it's going through that and it's decoding it. It's another thing which is XORed with AA. So it's stored in memory and it's being, you know, it's being uh, actually decoded and then returned to the caller. All right, so if we go back now to the caller of this function, so I'm just gonna go back. Uh, what happens is if we return a pointer which is uh, null, Okay, that means the right code wasn't entered and we already know what happens there. No code was found, there are no more features in this program, etc. we know that. But if this returns non-null, it'll go to this else statement and it ends up displaying some things you may now access special features, right? So it ends up displaying the return value and we can actually see that. So the return value is code result pointer. And if we actually go and right click on code result pointer and we type in secondary highlight, we can see 
that it is output to the terminal right here, and then it outputs to the terminal. You may now access special features, and if we go over here, we can see that's exactly what happened. Here's the code, and here is that you can now access special features. Okay, so you can see here, this is the case, the failure case where the code is not entered correctly. And you can see this local 54 equals FFFFFF. And then you can see here in the success case, there's this local 34 equals zero. Let's go through those really quickly. It's gonna give us a little dip into the disassembly side of things here. So let's take the failure case. The failure case, FFFFF is similar to negative one. It's just a different representation of negative one, assuming that the destination location is 32 bits. This is basically eight Fs, which if we go to our little sort of mini whiteboard here. So if we go here and we type in one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, that's actually four bytes, right? Four bytes is 32 bits, okay? And 32 bits is a D word in disassembly lingo. It's it, it, at least when you're disassembling sort of Intel architecture, binaries, PE executables, when we refer to a D word. So let's go through that really quickly. Byte is eight bits. And here's an example of a byte, um, you know, AA. We saw that, you know, in the, in the, uh, that was our little decoding XOR value, that our little key value. Word is 16 bits, and an example of a word might be um, one, two, three, four, for example. A D word is 32 bits, and that's going to be like the example we saw up there, which is FF, 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 or another example, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Okay. A quad word is 64 bits, and that's basically just going to be double this. So we're talking a 64-bit value, and those get quite large. Okay. And, and so the implication here is that local 54, and if we actually go and hover over this, you can see it says undefined double word length four. So this is a four byte value. So you can see if we highlight this line here, okay, it highlights this line. So let's go up here and just highlight any other line. Okay. And now I'm going to go back down to this and you can see it highlights this line right here. Now, if I go and push the middle mouse button over local 54, you'll see it'll highlight other local 54s in the context. That's kind of a nifty little feature. And what, what's happening here is you notice there's this nomenclature here that says D word pointer, and it has RBP plus local 54. Now, I would suggest that getting into disassembly and assembly language would be just an entire sort of video in, it, in and of itself. And there's probably plenty of those out there. I, I might do one. I don't know if you guys would be interested in deep diving more into this. Uh, but where I would kind of start with this is probably trying to explain a little bit about a CPU and the various registers. Now, you probably, many of you probably already know about this. But for those of you that don't, just really quickly, a CPU has many registers like RAX and RBX and RCX and RDX and RBP for example. And these are all different registers. And depending on the model of CPU you have and what era of CPU, like in the 2000s or in the 1990s, uh, the register names might be different and they might have different sizes. When we talk about RAX, we're talking about 64-bit value registers. So these values, these registers on a 64-bit CPU can hold values that are that large. But you can also represent 32-bit values in a 64-bit register, and that's done all the time. And you can also have ways of referring to uh, portions of a particular register. So if you refer to EAX, you're referring to a 32-bit portion of the RAX register. And, the, you know, there used to be a time when you had only 32-bit CPUs where the EAX register was kind of looked at as the big one, like, oh, that's a bigger value. It can hold 32 bits. And as things progressed forward, we now have RAX, which is the 64-bit register, and it's made up in part by the old EAX register, which is half of that 64 bits. Because as they moved forward, they kind of just doubled things and came up with new names for the new things while retaining backward compatibility with the old names. And they also did that when they went from 16-bit to 32-bit. So if you notice here, here, uh, you have this FFFF equals local 54. And what that's doing here is it's 
storing in RBP plus local 54, it's storing this value FFFF. So local 54 is basically a stack location, and we're not going to get into the deep details of that right now. But actually what it's doing here is it's doing a little bit of math here to calculate the location on the stack where it's going to store this value, which is negative one. And even though that looks like FFFFFF, if you look at it as a 32-bit value, it's viewed as negative one. Now, if we go to our little calculator here and we go to, um, let's go to quad word, let's clear everything and put in FFFF, FFFF, and you can see that it's also equal to 4 billion, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right? But if we go and change the magnitude to D word, and then we type in FFFF, FFFF, you can see in decimal when all you have is 32 bits and you have all Fs in there, the high bit is set to one, which makes the number negative. And it just so happens that FFFF, FFFF, in a 32-bit value is viewed as negative one. And you can still store that in a 64-bit value, but if the understanding is that you're only gonna look at the 32 bits of the big 64-bit value, then the, the computer can look at that or view that, depending on the context and what operations are being performed, it can look at that as negative one. And this sounds kind of like involved in stuff right now because this is not a step-by-step -step tutorial on the CPU or its register and things like that. So don't let this brief explanation throw you or make you feel like this is really daunting. It's stuff that's easy to grasp once you start to focus on it and once you have the right overview and that sort of thing. So I'm just giving a quick little kind of hint at some stuff here. So that can also be a little confusing and just don't let it confuse you, okay? So what happens is, Basically, this is storing negative one in this location. And what you can see is later on, it loads that negative one, which it stored earlier, into secret string pointer. And you might be saying, well, why is it loading it in secret string pointer? If that's the return value of negative one in the failure case, why is it putting it in there? Well, that's just because we named this variable earlier because this variable was used for something else earlier and we named it based on how it was being used. So if we click on secret string pointer and then click the middle mouse button to activate highlighting and then hover over this in, in Ghidra here, in Ghidra. So you can see in the little pop-up from Ghidra, the little helpful pop-up, it's showing us that secret string pointer is the RAX register. So it's actually not a memory location, but it's actually a CPU register. So before when we were assigning to secret string pointer, we were actually assigning a value to the RAX register. Let's go back up to that location. So if I can find uh, our use of secret string pointer, where was that? That was um, right up in here somewhere, I believe. Yeah, let me let me actually unhighlight that. And then we're going to go here. Actually, let me let me remove a secondary highlight. Let's remove that highlight and then let's click on secret string pointer and let's actually add a secondary highlight to that. So now we have this highlighted here and this is the one where we were calling cstr and we were assigning that pointer to secret string pointer, which we were passing to this function here called get the code. So what's actually going on here, if you look at uh, this call, if we highlight this line and we go and look what it highlights over in the disassembly window, you can see it's actually making a call to a function called basic string colon colon cster. Now that shouldn't surprise us, but one thing you should know about the calling convention with a 64-bit program like this in the Windows environment is that when you call a function like this, the return value, if there is any return value from this function, which there is, the return value is a pointer to the first character of the string. That return value comes back in the RAX register. So let me explain that. So if we highlight this string and let's bring it over to our whiteboard, which we had before in here where we were kind of explaining this. So here we, we showed this before earlier. And what I wanna do is sort of augment that. Let's just move this stuff down for a second. What I do is I have the, the disassembly here. This is the, the, the call function that we just saw. And what it's doing 
I'm going to get rid of all that. So if we go to get uh, Ghidra here, you can see it's doing this call right here, call basic string cster. And what it's doing is it's calling that function. And this function is going to return in the RAX register the address of the first character of that string. And the reason why it's going to return that address in RAX is because that's the standard for the calling convention on this particular platform. So you can look up the calling convention for any given platform, a particular binary that you're using and how it's compiled and what it's using within itself because it, th there's nothing about a CPU that says, well, you know, you have to return the return value in REX. The topic of calling conventions can be quite involved. This insert is not going to discuss all aspects of all calling conventions, of course. Since in this video we are focused on a 64-bit Windows PE executable, let's kind of discuss some fundamentals around x64 calling conventions for both Windows and Linux. On both Windows and Linux, the RAX register, which is a 64-bit register, is used to return values that are 64 bits or less. On both 64-bit Windows and Linux, that's enough to hold a pointer value, so a return value that is a pointer can be returned in the RAX register. But the RAX register can also be used to return something like an integer or something even as simple as a character value. When, when code within a 64-bit Windows or Linux application calls another function within that application. The initial arguments go into registers. On Windows, these initial registers would be RCX, RDX, R8, and R9. On Linux, they would be RDI, RSI, RDX, RCX, R8, and R9. For cases beyond those initial arguments to a function, the respective calling convention for the situation specifies how additional arguments are handled. Keep in mind that we're talking about the same processor here, right? So given any Intel or AMD processor, you're going to have these same registers, but notice how the operating systems use them differently. That's just simply to highlight that given any one CPU and the registers it has, there's nothing to really dictate that any one operating system must use those registers in a particular way. Regardless of the differences between these two cases, it's helpful to know that a 64-bit or less integer is returned in RAX. But really, when dealing with a very common scenario like 64-bit Windows applications or 64-bit Linux applications, looking up the calling convention and finding the particulars at a given moment if you haven't been immersed in it for some time is super easy. I jump around to a lot of different languages in a lot of different environments, and, and one of the things I don't waste brain cycles on are trying to retain information that I'm not immediately using. And the more detail that you take on as you delve into different areas, you might as well find that that's a good way not to waste brain cycles. Given this, the ability to look up information quickly is very common amidst researchers and developers and whatnot. So if you're new to this where you're kind of daunted about how you're going to remember it all, maybe you should keep in mind that you don't really need to remember it all. You just need to be able to be resourceful enough to get the information in front of your face when you need it. So the net effect of this call is to return that address in the RAX register. What Ghidra did for us here is instead of putting RAX here, which it could have done, it gave us a human readable version of text that we actually renamed to something to be even more uh, relevant to what we were analyzing. We named it secret string pointer. But the reality is if you go over here to the disassembly, secret string pointer is really, if I highlight this and hover, you can see over in the hover window here, secret string pointer is actually actually RAX which is the RAX register. Going back down to the end of the function here, let's actually name this variable here. Let's call this uh, return value, or let's call it exit code in failing case, all right? And then this one is the exit code in success case. They just happen to use different locations uh, given the different contexts in which these occur. But both of them end up in the RAX register. So we're gonna follow that right now. So if we go here, you can see that FFS is being loaded into EBP exit code in failing case. And then some stuff executes here to clean up some of the strings that were used. And after all that cleanup 
occurs. It then takes the value that was stored way up here and it loads it into secret string pointer. Well, secret string pointer is really RAX. So for right now, since we're finished with the earlier analysis where we wanted a uh, secret string pointer to, you know, we wanted to represent it with that name. We could actually rename that right now if we wanted to. And I'm going to rename this variable and I'm going to call it, um, I'm going to call it uh, RAX value. Okay. And when we do that, it's now called RAX value. You can tell it's been renamed here as well. All right. And what is happening, let's go to this case here. So we go here and now it loads that negative one into the RAX register and then it jumps to this label here so let's highlight this label by pressing the middle mouse button and scroll down and if you see it jumps down here and this is the code that's going to clean up a bunch of stuff and exit so let's hit l to change this label and let's call this exit funk and now it's called exit funk so if we go back to what was calling that let's go back well here let's go from here so let's highlight this again this evp exit code failing case gets loaded with negative one the FFF value and you can see the binary of that right here and then let's do middle mouse button on this and we can see that gets loaded right back up into the RAX register right here and then this thing jumps to uh, a label called exit funk so basically this loads RAX with negative one and then it jumps down here to exit funk exit funk will take the value which is in RAX and it will store it in RDI. Now it seems to be doing that temporarily because it needs to use RAX to do some things in here and it doesn't want to wipe out what value is in there because that value needs to return to the caller. So it's saving that temporarily in the RDI register which is another 64-bit register. So if we go over here to these registers there is RDI and RSI and we can go in there's a whole lot there's flags register and a lot of things we could talk about there. So it's put Putting the RAX value, and actually we could actually make this label even clearer. We could actually just say RAX. Let's just call this RAX uh, value, okay? And uh, it's loading that into the RDI register, and then uh, it's going to load that right back from RDI back into RAX, and then RAX isn't touched anymore, and this just kind of comes down here and it returns to the caller. And so that's how the exit code gets back to the caller in that phase case. If we go to the successful case, we can see here that it sets this thing exit code in success case. It sets it to zero. Well, let's highlight that. That's an, a location on the stack. So you can see it shows you the stack location and it's loading a zero in that location. And you can see here's the same zeros. You know, we had FFF before, but in this case, it's all zeros. Let's do middle mouse button on this and we can kind of see a similar pattern. It's cleaning up some strings. And after it cleans up those strings, it comes down here and it's going to load that zero, which it had stored in the stack location, right into the RAX register. And notice here, it does not have to go and jump to exit function because exit function happens to be the next one right after this. That's very common when you're looking at assembly language. If we go back up here, here's that failing case, and it doesn't want to run all this code for the success case. So you'll see it jump over all of this code here down to here. But the success case doesn't have to jump over anything because it just occurs right before the naturally succeeding exit function code. So it just flows naturally right into that code. And uh, and that's, that's not an uncommon thing. It's loading that zero into the RAX register and then it does the same processing. This is actually going to save that value in RDI and then it's going to do some stuff to clean up and then it's going to load that back up into RAX and then it returns zero to the caller. And by the way, if we go here and we type in uh, like demo app and I type in uh, le, um, door to back and now let me type in wrong code and I ask PowerShell what was the last exit code you can see it's negative one if I go here and say the door to back okay and I think it is the big secret 
and I hit enter, it's success. And if we look at the last exit code in the success case, it's zero. That's our analysis from disassembling stuff. If we go over to look at the original code, when it's failing, it returns negative one. And when it is successful, it returns zero. So basically what we've been able to do by using uh, Ghidra is we've been able to kind of understand what that source code might look like. And Ghidra actually in its decompiler actually gave us a lot of help in doing that. Ghidra is far more advanced than what it used to be like in the older days. If you go back a couple decades, in the older times, disassemblers and reverse engineering, you didn't get decompiling at all whatsoever. You literally had to go through the assembly and start picking that apart and using labels and all the same kind of things we did with the decompiled code, but you didn't get the decompiled code. So you had to really do a lot of work. So now with decompiling, which which is a great luxury that's available in a, in a tool like Ghidra today, you, you get all these advantages because you can kind of look at much easier code to interpret as convoluted as it might look. Trust me, it's very luxurious. You're getting a lot of stuff Stuff that's giving you stuff that if you go back like a decade or two or something like that, uh, you don't have those luxuries in the reverse engineering tools of yesterday. Okay, so that was a quick overview of reversing by kind of focusing on the decompile window here in uh, Ghidra. Now, the next thing is I want to go to where these binaries are. And actually, no, first what I want to do is exit Ghidra here. So let's actually save our information. So let's close this project. So here's where the debug version is. This is the one that we just were working with. And here's the release version. So I want to take these and cut these. And then I want to move them up here. And let's just call this moved apps or app, right? So we'll just move the app up here. I uh, can't do it. This file's open in another program. Let's see. Is it this program? Try that again. Are we at the command line maybe? Ah, uh, yes. Let's close this and try again. There we go. And you might be saying, well, why did you just move those? I'm going to explain that. What you see here are two arrangements. The top one is the original arrangement where the EXE and the PDB were side by side. When the PDB is in the same directory as the EXE, Ghidra is able to find find it and load it and use its symbols. The second arrangement at the bottom has moved the EXE as well as the PDB to completely different directories than the original build directory. Moving the PDB out of the original build directory is pretty similar to effectively deleting the PDB so neither a debugger nor Ghidra can find the PDB. We could have just deleted the PDB but I wanted to keep it around in case I wanted to go back and forth between Ghidra using the PDB with its symbolic information and Ghidra not having that symbolic information available. For this demonstration, we're going to use an arrangement similar to the one shown on the bottom of the screen here, where the PDB is not accessible to Ghidra, and so all Ghidra has is the executable, the binary. Um, let's go. What I, what I want to do is I want to open up just the debug version, but without the symbol file. So what I want to do is I'm going to cut and move the symbol file. Let's just call this debug symbol, symbols, okay? It just could be named anything. I want to just move it into a different folder because I don't want Ghidra to be able to find it. I want to have just the exe. And let's do the same thing for release. So let's take the release symbols and cut. Okay, let's make a folder called release symbols. And we are going to paste that's the release symbols. Now we have the release binary in its own folder, and we also have the debug binary in its own folder. And if we reference those in Ghidra, Ghidra will not be able to find the symbols. Okay, now that we have isolated the binaries for the release and the debug versions without any symbols, what we're gonna do is we're gonna start up Ghidra. So let's go to, uh, where's our copy of Ghidra? It's right here. So we're gonna double click on that, and this should launch Ghidra. Okay, with Ghidra launched, uh, we're going to create a new project and we're going to say this is non-shared and uh, we're going to call this one uh, demo app debug no symbols. Click finish. Now we're going to go into demo, oh no, not demo app. We're going to go into the moved app and then we're going to go to debug and now we're going to drag this over to here and we're going to click on all the defaults here and now we're just going to 
click OK on that, and we're going to double click to start the default uh, analyzer here. We're going to say yes, that we want to analyze, and now we're just going to click Analyze. And as with before, uh, there's going to be some status on the analysis in the bottom corner. And in fact, let me actually fix the window there so you can see that. Let me actually move this, crunch this a little bit here. Hold on. There we go. Okay, so we can kind of see uh, that we're here at this entry point. Okay, so I'm going to double click on this uh, common main and then that goes into common main SEH and then we're going to look in here to see if we can find uh, an entry point. Here's invoke main and if we go into invoke main we can see there is this thunk and then that brings us to what looks to be a function. Now notice it's called fun14001. It has the name which has the address embedded in it. So if you look over here in this window, you can see here's the beginning of the main function at this address. Ghidra has no symbols, so it has no idea what to name this. It's just going to call it fun for function, and it gives it the name that matches the address where it's located. It's up to us to name it. And if we scroll down in here, you can kind of see, and let me expand this now. If you go in here, you can kind of see the same strings that we saw before. So this is pretty much the same function. It's the same debug function. It hasn't really changed, but look at how more cryptic it looks because we don't have symbol information. Now this is the debug build. Uh, depending on the nature of the code, release builds can be even more difficult to understand because they perform a lot of optimization. So the code is going to be very optimized for the CPU, not for the developer's understanding. In, in a sense, a debug build is optimized for debugging purposes meaning it's not really optimized, it's uh, optimum, if you will, by not optimizing, it's more optimum for uh, uh, debugging purposes, for developers to look at things and to see the structure more clearly. Release builds take license to throw any structure out the window if it'll improve the speed of the program. So it can do whatever it wants to make that program primed to run well on a given CPU. And it doesn't really worry so much about whether it's easy to debug or whatnot. It just wants to create the fastest code. So we're still looking at debug code here. And so even without the symbols, uh, this is pretty luxurious. Uh, you know, it, this is actually would be considered easy street for uh, from a re reverse engineering standpoint. So uh, what we could do is like we know that this is main. So we could actually hit the L key and type in main. OK, woo. We made this a little bit easier <laughs> and uh, you know we could come on down here and maybe based on memory of what we already know if we didn't know the program already we might have to really look at this a little bit more carefully because we don't get any we don't get any easy to use names in any of this right so there's there's nothing we'd have to like kind of go figure out but when we see a string like this now if this string had been encoded it would have been more difficult to understand but this string is sort of like you know you can look at it and like what is that la door to back sounds like it's a back door right so we don't know what this thunk fun thing does here, but it's doing something with Lador de back here. So we can see here that this is a prompt of some kind. And so it looks like this might be uh, performing some output. So as we go through this and figure things out, we could actually begin to name things. So like I might name this as count for a console out. Now, even though that's not the function's real name, it doesn't really matter because a function name is really just symbolic anyway, as long as I come up with something that I can understand as I'm reversing that's fine. The function being called is the insertion operator function. It is being passed two arguments, count xref and the string to output. When reversing, creating perfect labels is not as important as creating labels that help you achieve your reversing goals. This example picked count because it's simple and it clearly indicates the call leads to console output. Frankly, if you're familiar with traditional C, like printf or printlin from another language, you could use those as symbols here instead of of count or instead of the insertion operator. You don't really have to spend tons of time saying, oh, what's the exact name for what this call is here? And then go find out that it's the insertion operator function. There might be cases where the specific label you use is really important, but a lot of the time when you're dealing with the periphery of things, the specific label doesn't really matter. You just want to be able to understand generally what's going on as you dig deeper into the program. In this particular case, we know 
show that this string is output to the screen. And it's clear it's calling a function that achieves that goal. So we just need to give it a label that lets us remember that. We might not even have to label this in this case, but putting a simple label there might just make it all look a little less cluttered and a little more clear to us as we get into the more important areas. So going through this and deciphering all this is a little bit more involved and there's different approaches depending on the context. But you can see the general shape of this kind of shows you like there's strings here, please enter this. So it looks like this is asking for some kind of name. And uh, if you enter in the name, it goes into this LD0. It ap appears this local LD0. It seems like this is actually calling some function with a string Lador to back and that. So maybe it's like comparing and you'd have to go in and start picking this stuff apart and it can get quite involved depending on the context. But as we can see, there's still some very good structure here. And with this kind of simple program, I'm not sure how bad it will be with release uh, code without the symbols, but why don't we go look at the release binary and just take a quick peek and see what it looks like. So let's actually take um, a copy um, of debug with symbols, and then let's get the symbols and do a copy from there into here. And then let's create release with symbols. And let's put uh, release with symbols here. So that's the release one. Let's get the symbols. And actually, now that we have the release with the symbols, we actually don't need uh, these folders anymore. So I can delete that one and delete that one. So now we have just the debug alone. And then we have the debug with the symbols. And same here. Here's just the release. And here's the release with the symbols. Now we're going to start up Ghidra twice. And we are going to create a new project. And I'm going to call this uh, debug with symbols. I'm going to go to the moved app, debug with symbols. And I'm going to put this in here and say, yep. Going to click OK. Going to double click. Yes, let's analyze, analyze. Okay, so here we are at the main function, and you can see because we have symbols, there's some information in here that's very easy to understand. Now, this doesn't have our variables that we rename because this is a brand new project, but what I wanted to do is just compare a brand new project with symbols, uh, release, and debug builds. So what we're going to do is go to Ghidra again. We're going to start up another instance. And we're going to say new project and we're going to say release with symbols, uh, demo app, release with symbols. And we're going to go to moved app, release with symbols, bring the demo app over here. This is the release version of the demo app. Click OK, take all the defaults. Yes, we'll analyze. Let's move this over here. Okay, so you can see the beginning over here brought us to a really nice main function. Uh, let's click OK on that. And this one brought us to a nice main function as well. But if we compare the release version with the debug version, now th this is not particularly, uh, th this kind of code is not going to get totally different um, between the two, but there will be some differences. Now, if you look at this, this kind of has a structure. This is the debug version. And so if you walk through this lesson and you do this on your own and you compare the two, you'll be able to see that the release one is a, a little more complex to decode if you if you imagine that you have no knowledge of the original program because the compiler and the linker are going to take license to go ahead and rearrange all of this in order to make it optimum for the CPU not for debugging not for the developers you know consideration in terms of the logical structure of the program so we're, we're not going to go through these but you can kind of 
see here, there's a bunch of stuff here going on and it's just less, th this one comes in and it kind of starts off right away like asking like, enter your full name and stuff. And th this one has that up here, enter your full name. And then it comes down here and here here's the check. There's some, there's some check going on where it's looking for 15 here. Is something have 15? This might be inlining some C++ functionality from the library. That can be complex. So in other words, you're actually seeing functions that have been put in line uh, by the linker that came from the C++ library. They might have been put right in here. So you're seeing stuff that's in line. And the reason why in line is optimum is that anytime uh, a program needs to call a function or jump somewhere, a jump instruction or a call instruction, especially a call instruction where you have parameters you have to set up and then you call another function, there's a certain amount of performance impact when you when you have to make a call. If the CPU can avoid having to branch, avoid having to call to some other location, the code will execute faster. So what you'll notice in, in an optimized program is it might actually take advantage of opportunities to inline functionality from the library as an example, or it could even be your own code gets inlined into other areas of your program. You can think of inlining as a process of taking some code you have in a function, and rather than call that function, you bring the function to the place where it's called. So instead of having to call it, you just run the function right there where it was called. So without picking this apart offhand, there's a memory comparison taking place here. We didn't perform a direct memory comparison. My guess is it took the string class, the operator equals function, and it inlined it right here within main because we do perform an equality check to see if the user entered the door to back. And what this is doing, um, I happen to know from some past experience that the STLC class will it has a buffer for small strings. I think it's like 15, 16 characters. And beyond that, then it will do allocation. So when I saw this 15 here, this 0xf, which is 15, I'm kind of like, oh, there's some buffer checks going on here. So you can see it's doing some checks and saying, well, if, if this is this way, then go and use the pointer uh, variable in the string class. Otherwise, you know, go and do this. It's like there's a lot of stuff that's been put into our main function that we didn't even write in the original program that's not even in the original program. That's because it's more optimum when the program runs to pull in all this stuff and inline it here so this doesn't have to go and call to other places. But when we're debugging a program and we call a function, if the linker keeps that function located somewhere else where our program, our little function that we're looking at doesn't change that much, when we look at our function and we see that it calls somewhere, the logical structure of our function will be more clear to us because we'll see our function, we'll see that it calls somewhere else to do something, we can go look that at that other place to see what that function does, and then by seeing those things separately, we can kind of understand, well, that is is a little, that, that function is like a black box. It does something. We know what it does. And so we don't have to really see it intermixed with our code. But when you're looking at optimized code, the compiler and the linker says, oh, the developer is compiling and linking this program and the developer wants a release build. So the developer is not concerned with how we convolute all this. Let's just jumble it all together in a way that's really optimum for the CPU. We don't really care about keeping it all organized and stuff so that somebody debugging the program can understand its structure while they're debugging it. We really care about optimization. So let's just create some binary blob that's going to do the same thing as the logic they have in that C++ program, but let's not worry about the logical structure. So that's kind of what I was talking about earlier between debug and release builds, but this kind of accentuates it when you compare even something this simple, you can see that it's bringing in functionality from some other library and it's putting it right in the middle of the original function. So it kind of makes it a little more sort of cryptic to kind of understand and figure you're out. In the next couple sections, we're going to go through some details on going through the decompile window as well as in the disassembly window for some optimized code. These can be kind of involved and for your first time through, you may want to skip this. You can use the table of contents to skip ahead.
What I want to focus on is this area between get line and this if statement. If we go over to the demo app program, we can see that here is username. It's an STL string. Here is where get line is called to accept data from the user at the terminal and place it into the username STL string variable. If this is not equal to the door to back, it will exit. If it is equal, it will continue on and ask, please do tell me a secret. Notice between get line and the logic to compare against Lador to back is very simple. You got one line and then another line. Logically, this is pretty straightforward. Get input from user, check to see if it matches something. Let's quickly go over to Ghidra with the debug build. So this is the debug build. Notice there is get line and then operator not equals. Let's go back over to the release build. Notice there's get line all the way down here to ivar6 there is no call to operator not equal let's switch back to the debug build and let's look at this for a second the user is prompted the function get line is called with sin and a variable local 1d0 which will hold the result of what the user types in at the terminal this is a call to the function operator not equals passing it the stl string that contains what the user entered and the door to back you can see that these three lines here closely match the logic in the original program. If we go back to the original program here, you can see this is the username string. The prompt is put out for the user to enter their name. There's a call to get line, which ends up putting what the user enters at the terminal into this STL string username. Then the operator not equals function is called with username and the door to back. And that's what is actually happening on this line. This is a call to operator not equal, taking an STL string and a C string and comparing the two. And if the two are not equal, it'll execute this code. Otherwise, it'll continue on here. If we go back to Ghidra debug build, we can see get line is called, operator not equals function is called. If it is true that it is not equal, it will exit and notice even how this structure closely matches the structure that we see here. Now let's go back to the release version of Ghidra and look, we have a call to get line here. There's a whole mess of stuff. And then there's a check against Ivar six equals zero, which is the equality check. So basically this check right here says, if what the user entered is equal to the door to back, then go and do this. So even the ordering of the logic has changed in the release build. We see two things here. One is there's stuff that's been added here into our function. It no longer has just what we had in our original function. The compiler and the linker work together to do something here, which I'm going to explain in a second. But in addition to that, there's actually a check for equality against the door to back. And if what the user entered is equal to the door to back, then it goes and does all of this right here. Whereas our logic in the debug build says, if it's not equal, then do this. And this closely matches the original program. If not equals, go do this. In this case, the default situation is that the code has been elongated for the sake of optimizing for speed. This has increased the size of the program in this particular area, which means this particular area will run faster than it would in the debug build. Now, you're not gonna notice those speed differences by a visual appearance, but if this were highly algorithmic code, the performance impact between debug and release build can usually be noticed, and you can usually do timings between the two and notice differences. How significant those differences are are gonna be completely context dependent. In this particular case, even though performance is not a big deal in this particular area, the compiler and the linker don't know that. They just know they're supposed to create a release build, and so they do their best to optimize for speed. When you're reversing a release build that's been optimized for speed, you're gonna see things that don't match the original program structure because the optimizations end up mixing things up or pulling things in. The compiler and the linker can take whatever liberties are needed, and there's some pretty extraordinary optimizations that can take place. This is actually a pretty straightforward optimization. What has happened here is that the compiler and the linker have worked together to inline the operator not equals function into this area of code. All this code that was added between here and here is actually the STL strings implementation for operator equal. And the compiler and the linker with an interest in optimizing for speed decided to put a copy of that functionality in line in the code, as you might say. By doing that, this program at this particular point doesn't have to prepare arguments or pass them on the stack or actually make a call. By avoiding those steps, 
everything runs a little faster. So if we go back over to the app here and we highlight string and we hit F12 uh, and then we hit F12 on basic string, which is how string is implemented, and we look in here, we can actually find, and I'm actually going to go and I'm going to find operator not equal. You can see here there's several operator not equal. So the implementation we're looking for for operator not equal is this one. It takes a basic string as the first parameter. That's the and the next parameter is lm const lm pointer and that's the right. This is like a C string because lm is a template parameter and that's going to resolve to be care for the case of our C string. So you can see that operator not equals doesn't really have a big implementation and and that's because it relies on operator equal equal. So it calls operator equal equal and it just negates that result. So let's go up here and look for operator equal equal. And we're looking for one that is similar in that it should be taking a basic string and an LM pointer. Here it is right here. So you can see here's operator equal equal and it takes a basic string and it takes the same const LM pointer right so you have left side and right side. And then it calls left.equal, which is the STL basic strings implementation of equal. This will return true if it's equal or false if it's not equal. So we'll highlight that and hit F12. And we can see that there's a couple of different options here. So let's click on this one because this one has an LM pointer and that's the one we're interested in. This is basically being called on the username instance. It's equivalent to saying username equal with that string. But we can't do that directly with the underscore equals function. That's an internal function. But we ultimately call into that by using the constructs that are shown here. Now this equals function is actually calling a function called traits equal. Traits equal is going to perform an equality check. But notice the parameters that this is being passed in order to perform the equality check. On the username string object, because remember this is a basic string, it's using this member my pair my my val, my pointer to get a pointer to the string data in the username STL string. Again, this is a basic string implementation, and that's ultimately what username is. So username has all of this. We're going to go into this in a second. It then goes and accesses what the size is of the username string. So it's passing a pointer to the username string, the start of it, and then its size. It's also passing underscore pointer, and then it's performing a, a length check, and then it's calculating the length on that pointer. So this is Lador to back, and this is the length of Lador to back. Okay, so I'm going to go and put my cursor on my pointer and I'm going to hit F12. And when I hit F12, you notice that we go to some place which doesn't look like the implementation for my pointer. Now, sometimes these navigation tools may not go exactly where you want them to go. So I'm going to hit Control minus to go back. And what I'll usually do is then grab or search around for the implementation of my pointer. In this case, I already kind of know to use pointer space my pointer here. So this is really like pointer and then, well, I can actually show you how I derive this. What you can do here instead is grab my pointer and the first parenthesis and then put that up in here and then go to the beginning and put an asterisk and then a space. And that'll bring you to the implementation. And this is the core area that we want to see in relation to the release build here. So here's the release build where we have all this stuff that we don't have an X1 for and we're about to get that explanation. The simple reality is an STL string has two possible ways of storing the actual string. For small strings it'll use buff. For larger strings it'll perform allocation and deallocation and it'll use PTR. Let's quickly look at large string engaged. It's right down here. It simply says if buff size is less than the size of the string, less than or equal to the size of the string, then we're not using buff, we're actually using the large string. So large string engage will return true when the size of the data maintained by the STL string is larger than what this buffer can hold. So in a sense, this is like saying, let's return the small buffer. But let's check to see if the large buffer is being used instead. Oh, it is. Well, let's change what we're going to return, and then let's return it. Now, you might think this is a waste of time and energy to set the variable here and set the variable here, but it actually makes the code very easy to read and understand, and it avoids unnecessary indentation and multiple return paths and things like that. And the compiler is going to optimize this out. This is going to 
end up being very efficient machine code. Now let's hit control minus to go walk back to the user of my pointer. I have to click control minus many times and now we're back here. So let's reiterate. So we're back to the function that calls my pointer. It's going to call my pointer to get the right pointer. We already know how that works. We just went over it and it's going to also pass the other string that would be the door to back in this case. It's then going to call traits equal. If you go into traits equal, it'll then perform a comparison. If I put the cursor over uh, compare and I hit F12, it actually doesn't go anywhere. That's because it doesn't know what traits is because we'd have to go to the implementation of the string. Uh, we can actually go and do that, but what I'd rather do is just look for the word compare and I'm gonna search up. So I'm gonna hit Shift F3 to search up. And we see here's narrow care traits. And inside of narrow care traits, we see that it has a function here called compare. When we look at compare, we see it's implemented in terms of memcomp. And there we have it. So now if we go back over to the Ghidra decompile, we can look at this area of code more confidently. The user is prompted, please enter your full name. There's an STL string that's represented by local 58 and getLine is called to accept input from the terminal into that string. This is username and we can hit L and type in username stir. The next line is going to assign a uvar10 to the address of stir. Now this area right here happens to be the my pointer function that we were looking at. Quick insert here, folks. Guess what? The three lines of decompiled Ghidra code, lines 39 through 41, are the release optimized variation of the my pointer function. These three lines amount to the three machine instructions, LEA, CMP, and CMOVE NC, that together consist of only 17 bytes of machine code. We discuss all of these instructions in detail in the next section. My pointer assigns result to username stir. So let's hit semicolon and we can say uvar10 equals STL strings buff. Now I don't necessarily always comment something like that once I understand it, but I'm just doing it here to show that you could do that if it was something that you felt you would come back to and it would be confusing to remember. You just put a little comment in there. And I'm going to name this uvar10, I'm going to call this pbuff. So we can see it defaults to pbuff equals the address of username stir. And that is the pointer to buff. In release builds, that would be the start of that union that contains both buff and PTR, depending on interpretation. So in this case, it's accessing buff. Then it looks to see if the string is larger than 15 characters. If it is, then it says, instead of using buff, use PTR. Now in this case, it's not using the address of PTR, but it's accessing the contents of what PTR points to, because this is a pointer value. So it's actually loading this pointer value into pbuff, whereas this is loading the address of that buffer location. It's a subtle difference so in this case, pbuff is being assigned the address of the start of that union. So if we switch back over to where that union was, the address of the start of this union is the start of this buffer. This is assigning pbuff the value of PTR, which is located at the start of the union. That's different than the address of the union. The address of the union is the start of this buffer. In the case of using PTR, while the address of the union is the beginning of the actual pointer value, what we want is the pointer value. So this is assigning actually the value at this location to the address. There's a difference here. The first one is assigning the address of this. The second one is getting the value located at this location. Now, if you're confused by that, you should just look at it very carefully within a debugger and study the source code. Everybody has to do that when they're initiating themselves with C and C++ and optimizations and reversing. And you'll get it, so don't be daunted by it. It's a lot of stuff. You'll get used to enjoying that feeling of ambiguity. Switching back over here, we can see this more clearly in assembly language, which we're going to look at in a couple seconds. Let's just keep going forward and go through the logic at a higher level first, and then we're going to jump over here and go through the logic. All this code combined is a decision as to what pbuff is going to be. In one case, it's going to be the address to the start of the STL string, which just so happens to be the address of the beginning of that union. But if the string is larger than 15 bytes, it's going to change that value and it's going to assign it 
to the value PTR, which is actually located at this address. But there's a difference here. This is getting the value that's located in that address and putting it here. This is getting the address and putting it in here. You'll have to look at that over and over if you don't know these kinds of constructs. So this will come down and say, if the string is 15 bytes, and that's part of the check and you'll see the code won't move forward in the success path if the string size is not equal to 15 bytes. And if we go back over here to the STL library, you can see that check as part of traits equal. It checks to see if the two sizes are equal. Lador to back is equal to 15 characters, so that would be the right size. And it wants to validate that what the user entered is also 15 bytes. So that's the first step in the comparison. And then we have an AND operator. And the second step of the comparison is to actually check the bytes of the string itself. And that's what happens here with the mem comp. So if we go back over to the STL library to see compare, we can see that it calls mem comp. And so that's being inlined as well. So mem comp, as I mentioned, will return zero if this equals this for the number of bytes specified here. And f in hex is 15. So if they are equal, this will be 0. i var 6 will be equal, and it will continue on. We could actually label this now. We could say i mem comp result. You probably wouldn't need to do that because most people know what mem comp returns. And so if you, you can glance at it quickly. But I'm just showing you that you can do that. OK, we're going to go into discussing the disassembly aspect of stuff now. And that can be kind of involved more so than the decompile window. So if you feel it's not your speed at this particular point in time, no issues at all. I recommend you go and click to advance past this section if you feel it's not for you at this time. But with that said, don't be daunted by it. If you have no idea what's going on and you're curious about it, sit through it and see what you can pick up. Now, before we begin disassembly, what I want to do is go over to to uh, the program and let's put a breakpoint right here on line 34. Now you want to be in the release build and then you're going to hit F5 or you're going to start debugging. You're going to type in Lador de back and the breakpoint should get hit right after you enter Lador de back. Right click here on the line and choose go to disassembly. Right click and choose show code bytes and right click and say show line numbers. We're going to come back here, but I just wanted to set this up first. Let's go back to Ghidra. Let's start here after get line and look at this in the disassembly. So we'll move this over. So we're going to be focusing on that section of inline code from the STL string. Let's start right after get line where we have pbuff equals the address of username stir. OK, well, the first thing you'll notice here is there's an instruction called LEA, which is load effective address. So what a load effective address does is it loads this address, which is calculated here into whatever is specified here. So let's go back over to the raw disassembly and you can see LEA RCX username. What this means is load effective address of this address into this register. So when you see brackets with a symbol or a number in here, usually it means to get the contents of the value that is pointed to by whatever is in the brackets. But in this case, when you have LEA, it means calculate the address and put it in to RCX. So just keep that in mind. You'll see brackets used in a couple different ways there in the assembly language. And the one we're looking at is the one that's used by load effective address, which is to take the value that's in here, calculate its address, and put that address into RCX. Now let's go back over to Ghidra. Now you'll notice Ghidra does not show RCX here, but it instead shows this argc value. Let's hit enter on that. We can see that argc is a symbol that's meant to indicate the ECX register. The reason the reason why that's the case is that the first use of RCX in this function was its use as a parameter to this function for argc. Remember the calling convention discussion that we went through where on this platform the RCX register is the first register that's used for the first parameter. The RDX register is used for the next parameter. That means argc was passed in RCX and argv was passed in RDX. And you can see that here. It's showing you that argc is a symbol 
for ECX register and argv is a symbol for RDX. Since these common registers like EIX, ECX, RDX, and so forth can be used for many different purposes within a single function. The initial symbol that Ghidra assigns to a register is not always applicable for later points within the same function. So let's hit the Alt and back arrow to go back to uh, its use where we're looking at it for uh, this pbuff case, right? So we're at the pbuff case, which has this LEA instruction. So as you can see, a binary can use the same CPU register for different variables or purposes throughout the life of a function. Ghidra will assign a variable to a register given how that register is first used within a function. We can see that Ghidra assigned the first function argument, argc, to the lower 32 bits of the RAX register, usually referred to as the ECX register. While the name argc makes sense for ECX at that earlier time in the function, it may not make sense for later points with in the same function, such as the case with the LEA instruction we're focused on now. Ghidra therefore allows us to rename a register as desired. Generally, there are two approaches to renaming a register, one which changes an existing name that you have the cursor on, and a likely more nuanced and better approach which changes the register's name at a certain point in the function until it is changed once again at a later point in the same function. In this tutorial, we are using the simpler, less nuanced approach. But let's quickly go over both so you can use whichever you prefer. After you become more familiar with Ghidra, you will likely want to use the more nuanced approach, but in any given situation, you should use simply whatever works best. We can see here that pbuff is assigned the short 16 character buffer located at the start of the string. So if we go to the LEA instruction over here, we can see that this line is related to this line here. This is loading the effective address of RSP plus 20, which is offset 0 of the string. However, we can see the name of the variable here is argc. As we pointed out, that's argc because upon entry to the function, the rcx register contained argc. So Ghidra appropriately let us know that argc was the ecx register, which is the lower 32 bits of the rcx register. Let's go back. So we want to rename this so it makes sense at this point in the function. So I'll click to put the cursor on argc and I'll press the L key. I'll hit enter to rename the function variable and I'll just call this rax value. Now you'll notice it renamed this as rax value, but notice up here this was renamed to rax value. And in fact, if I hit enter on this, you can see the parameter that's passed to the function has also been renamed to rax value. Let's go back. Now, if your goal is just to focus on an area of code here, quickly renaming like that is not a problem. Sometimes you might just be working quickly and want to do something. Other times you might be wanting to create a more formal disassembly listing of something. And in that particular case, you might want to use a little bit more of a nuanced approach. So if I press Control Z, it will undo my rename. And you can see it changes the name of this back. If I do redo, which is Control Shift Z, it'll redo my changes. So by pressing Control Z, I can undo my rename and Control Shift Z will redo the rename. This might be an approach you can use to examine what the effects are of your rename. Let's undo this rename and use the more nuanced approach. Control Z and it's undone. So we'll put the cursor on argc, we'll right click and and we'll go down here to references and we'll notice there's a thing here called create register reference. Let's click on that. Notice how it changed this variable name, which is really the RCX register, to a name called local RCX120. It has effectively created a new variable which references the RCX register. Notice up here that this reference to argc is still in place and if we click enter on local RCX120, we can go here and we can see that the argc definition for ECX is still here and there's been a new one added for our register reference that we just created and this one is for RCX which is 8 bytes. Let's go back. So now we can click on this generic name and we can use edit label. I'm going to dismiss the menu, put my cursor on local RCX120 and I'm going to press L so that I can learn the shortcuts. I'm going to hit enter to accept renaming a function variable. I'm going to call this rcx underscore username stir dot underscore buff. 
Now, even though this is my own name that I've created, and even this notion of username stir.buff is not really relating directly to the C++ structure, this entire name is enough for me to kind of understand what's going on. Let me click OK. And you can see it named not only this one, but this one down here. But notice it left this one. And I can press Enter on mine to navigate up here. And you can see that the original is still in place. And here's my new one. Let's do Alt left arrow to go back. So if we go down here, we can see the name is used again, and I know that that name is still valid. RCX is the same variable here, so we're not going to touch that. So let's go down here to this bottom one down here and right click on it and go down here to References and let's create a register reference. I'm actually going to dismiss the menu and use Control Alt and R. So I'm going to dismiss the menu, click my mouse there, press Control and Alt and then R, and it's automatically going to create a new variable for me, local RCX 179. Notice it did not change my register reference that I created here, nor did it change the one for argc. And if I highlight local RCX179 and hit enter, you can see it just simply added a new register reference after the one that I had previously created, and it left this original one created by Ghidra intact. Let's go back. I created this local RCX179 just to show you how you could create multiple register references. I'm going to press Control Z to undo that. And while this is not correct here, we're not focused on this area. And that's basically it. There's two ways I just showed you how to rename a register variable. One is to just do an outright rename of how it's used everywhere. And the other one is a little more nuanced approach where you're effectively adding a new variable name that you assign to a register reference. And you can create as many of those as you need to in the function as you progress forward in your reversing effort. So I'm going to click here on RCX and then press L. And then I'm going to choose to rename the variable. And I'm going to call this RCX value for now because it's very clear. But keep in mind, if I hit enter on this and we go back up here, it'll actually show us that RCX value as a symbol equals the ECX register. And it will change the name of this parameter from argc to RCX value. Now remember, when you use the L key directly to rename an existing variable, such as the default that Ghidra creates for a particular register at the start of a function, you're going to rename it for the entire function. And if you're playing fast and loose and working quickly and you just need to look at something quickly, that may be good enough. However, for more involved situations, you're probably going to want to use the more nuanced or register reference approach to create new register values as you progress forward in your reversing efforts. Now I want to show you something. If you need to look at a reference manual while you're doing this, you can right click here and choose processor manual. Now if you haven't set up the processor manual, Girda shows you these instructions. We can choose copy and close. I'll load up notepad and paste this in. Now I'm going to copy this path here to the location where it wants me to put the x86 manuals. I'm going to hit control C. I'm going to hit Windows E to open up Explorer. Alt D. Control V, hit enter, and now we're here. Now we need to go find these manuals. So if we go down here, this is the link to the manuals. And how these manuals have been delivered over the years has changed. They used to have individual sections in PDF files, but now they have various arrangements that you can choose from based on how you like to use manuals. So in one case, they put everything into a single PDF. Now this one gets to be really, really large, but it can be useful if you're doing a search and you just want to search everything at once. Then down here, there's another one here. This is the four volume set. It's the same thing as this single volume set, except it's broken down into these four. And if we go down here, you can see there's a 10 volume set right here, where you have 10 different PDFs. Let's go back up here. Let's go back over to the notepad, copy and paste. You can see it's asking for this manual based on our right click. It wants to find manual two that contains 2A, 2B, 2C, and 2D. Let's go back over to the Intel website, and you can see here's one that matches 2A, 2B, 2C, and 2D. So Ghidra is apparently relying on using these particular manuals. I don't know if it will require all these manuals, but let's download all of these as a set and put them in the same folder. So here are the downloads. I'm going to take them and I'm going to cut them. And then I'm going to go over to that Explorer window that I prepared before, and I'm going to hit Control-V to paste. Now all the manuals are here. We can close this window, close this window, close the Intel browser thing, close Bing, close the copy-paste, right-click in Ghidra, choose Processor Manual, and voila. Now it doesn't really go to the exact spot, but I can show you a trick here. 
that can help you find it. Uh, you just scroll around and find one of these instructions. Notice there's an EM quad here. I think that's an EM quad, that big dash. Copy that dash and then do Control F and put the dash up here in the search window. Get rid of any characters just so you have the one dash right there. Now that you have that one dash, put in LEA and it should bring us to the section. We can either click here in the contents or it would find this right here. So you can actually read about load effective address right here. This instruction goes way back to earlier processors. A lot of these instructions do. If you're really interested in assembly language and CPU instructions, if you learn to navigate all of these manuals and just knowing how to download these and find that instruction and kind of see what's what is very convenient. Okay, so let's actually uh, close this. So RSP plus 20 is the location of user name stir. So what Ghidra is showing us is that the processor is taking the effective address for RSP plus 20, which is username stir, and it's putting that into the RCX register. So the RCX register is a pointer to the start of username stir, which is pointing to the start of username. And we can see that happens here. This is loading RCX with the address of username. And what we're going to do is go to the next instruction here. So the next instruction is CMP, which is compare. So we know that this one put an address into RCX value. The address was the start of username string or username in the source code. And we can see from this that username is actually located on the stack at RSP plus 20. Just know that username is located somewhere and its address has been put into the RCX register. So the next line here is actually going to do a comparison between one value as expressed here and another value as expressed here. So I'm actually going to do a right click, choose processor manual again, and I am going to do uh, CMP and uh, I still have the little dash on here and we're going to click on CMP. That's compare two operands. Now a comparison operation is actually a subtraction operation that doesn't affect the values of anything that's being subtracted. It's a subtraction that takes place in order to change CPU state so subsequent instructions can use that state to make decisions like jumping or not jumping, moving a certain value or not moving a certain value. The CPU state I'm referring to is largely held within what are known as CPU flags. Now we're not going to get deeply into this, but just think of a flag as a bit and all the bits of all the flags are stored in the E flags register. So the flags are all in a register and when you perform a CMP operation or comparing operation against two operands, you're basically subtracting the first one from the second one in order to affect the bits in the E flags register and each bit has a particular meaning. We're going to touch on one example in a second. Let's close this and get back to Ghidra. So on this line here we are comparing a 64-bit value that's located at this address with the value 16. And if I highlight this entire CMP line here, you can see it's related to this line here. Well, this line is comparing the value of 15, doing a less than comparison, with the current maximum buffer size stored in my res. So if we switch over to our debugger, which is running here, we, we can actually um, highlight username and we can go to Quick Watch. Okay. And when you go to Quick Watch, this thing shows you what the size is, right? The door to back 15. But let's go to Raw View. If you go into Raw View, you can open these up and you can find my res. Here's my res. My res is the current size of the buffer maintained by this string instance. My size is the current length of the string making use of that buffer. There's another thing I want to show you here. Notice that this is the union that we were talking about earlier. So this is the BX, that BX union. Here is buff, uh, the actual buffer that is 16 bytes long. And this is PTR. And all these are like in a union that are pointed to by the same address. And then you'll notice that my size and my res follow that. The size of BX is 16 bytes. So buff is a 16 byte buffer. 
that's the largest uh, item which is in the union. PTR is a 64-bit pointer, which is eight bytes, and eight bytes is less than the 16 bytes for buffer. So both of these occupy the same memory location, being that they're in a union BX. Therefore, this does not add any length to the BX union. Neither does this alias. So BX is 16 bytes. If it is 16 bytes and it is located at the start of the string, it's the first item which is in the data area for the instance of the username STL string. The next item that immediately follows it is a value called my sign. My size is a 64-bit value, so that's going to be 8 bytes. So if you take 16 plus 8, you have 24 bytes so far. So we have 16 bytes, and then we have another 8 bytes, which would bring us to 24. And then there is another 8, which would bring us to 32 bytes total. So this begins at 24 bytes into the string. So basically, this is at offset 0 into username string. This is at offset 16 because this is 16 bytes, so this begins at byte 16. Because this is 8 bytes long, this one begins at 24 bytes. Let's go back over to Ghidra. In Ghidra, we notice it's saying username 24. Well, that's 24 bytes offset into username. So it's basically saying the location of the start of username stir plus 24 bytes, get a value from that location at offset 24, that's going to be the size of the buffer currently maintained by this string. In our case, 15. 15 is the 16 byte buffer less one byte for the null terminator. It's gonna take that 64 bit value and it's gonna subtract from it the value 16 in decimal which is 10 in hex. Now what that's going to do is it's going to affect a bunch of different flags. The subtraction that the comparison performs behind the scenes won't affect this value. It obviously won't affect this constant value there. What it will affect is the E flags register and it will affect certain flags. Now the flag that we're interested in here is the carry flag. If you take a number and subtract a larger number from that initial number, you will cause the carry flag to be set. Here are three examples. 10 minus 1 equals 9, which is 64-bit, all zeros with a 9, no carry flag set, and in processor instructions, you might see that referred to as NC. The next example is 10 minus 10, which is 0. The carry flag would not be set, and again, that might be referred to as NC, or no carry. 10 minus 11 is negative 1, and that causes an integer overflow or underflow, depending on how you look at it, and the carry flag would be set in this case. And that's referred to sometimes as CY for carry. So you have no carry NC and carry CY. So when the CMP instruction executes, it's performing the subtraction and it's adjusting the flags accordingly. Once those flags are set from the CMP instruction, subsequent instructions can do things based on the settings of various flags as you're about to see. Back here in Ghidra, we can see that the compare instruction subtracts the size of the string buffer from the number 16. When the small buffer is in use, the size of the string buffer is 15. That's 16 excluding the null terminator. When that small buffer buff is in use, the size of the string buffer is 15. When a larger buffer is in use, the PTR value is set and the size of the string buffer will be 16 or greater. Therefore, when the small buffer is in use, use, this compare instruction will result in a carry flag being set. When the larger buffer is in use, meaning the PTR value has been allocated and assigned, there will be no carry, or NC. This will become more important as we examine the next instruction. Another way to say that, if we go over to the app here and we open up that union, as soon as the string length exceeds this size, this small buffer array can no longer be used, and the STL string needs to allocate a pointer off the heap and set it to this PTR value, both within the same union there. So this particular comparison against the STL string length is basically going to have no carry flag set if PTR is being used. But if PTR is not used and buff is being used, the carry flag will be set. Let's go down to the next line here. The next line is C move and C. Well, let's right click and do processor manual. C move CC is conditional move and the last two characters denote the 
kind of conditional move that's being performed. So if we go back over here, the kind of conditional move that's being performed is NC, which is no carry. Let's look at NC in here. NC is no carry. So let me find that. There it is right there. And you can see they show several variations of this, but we're interested in the one that works with 64-bit uh, values, I believe. Yes, this is a 64-bit value because it's using the RCX register and it will be moving a quad word pointer. We'll get into that in a second. So this is the one that's taking place there. And you can see it says move if not carry. So CF equals zero is carry flag not set or carry flag equals zero. This comparison operation, if it sets CF equals zero, then this move operation will take place. Move if not carry. However, if this thing sets the carry flag, this operation will be ignored. It will be as if this instruction was not present, it will skip this instruction because the carry flag is set and this is only going to move if not carry. If the carry flag is set by this, this operation will take place. What will this operation do? This operation will move the 64-bit value that is pointed to by this address into the RCX register. Well, we know that RSP plus 20 is username stir. And we know that that union is the first thing, which is located at that address. So this is loading in the 64-bit value, which is located at the start of username stir. That value is the PTR value, or the first eight bytes of this union. Whenever those first eight bytes are referenced, it's usually this underscore PTR value. This is checking to see if the size of the string buffer held in my res is 16 or more bytes. And if it is 16 or more bytes, there will be no carry flag set by this comparison. And if no carry flag is set, this will move the PTR value into the RCX register, overwriting the value that was put into the register here. So a point of clarification, this username stir24 is actually referring to this at offset 24. So you have this at offset zero, this at offset 16, this at offset 24. So this is the size of the buffer in use at this time, which may be larger than the current size of the string. In our case, the buffer size is 15 bytes and the door to back is also 15 bytes, so they match. But when a buffer of 16 bytes or more is required and therefore PTR is in use, this will be a value of 16 or more. So this is a way of telling which one of these union members is the valid one to use for the storage space for the string. Taking all these lines together, assume that the 16-byte buffer will be used. However, if we find out the string buffer is larger, then we know the PTR value is being used and assign that instead to the RCX register. Now the RCX register has the proper address for the start of the username string character data. So if you entered in Lador to back, the RCX register is an address to the L, the first L in the string Lador to back. Moving on to the next line, we see that we're loading a quad word pointer, which is a 64-bit value from RSP plus username stir 16. We know that the offset to username at 16 bytes is just past that small buffer. If we go over here, we can see just past that small buffer. So, so here's the small buffer, and that's the BX union. And that BX union right after that is my size. My res is the current size of the PTR buffer. If this string is larger than this buffer where the PTR value is being used, my res will represent the allocation size for PTR. My size will be how much of that buffer is being used, the current string size. This username stir 16 is kind of like saying username stir plus 16, as in plus 16 bytes. Well, we know that the union is 16 bytes, so plus 16 bytes is going to be the start of my size, which is a 64-bit value that represents the current size of the string. Our string, Lador to back, fits into the small buffer. It does not require use of PTR. To be very clear, 
my res can be different from my size. My res is the size of the buffer. My size is how much of that buffer is being used to hold the current string, which could be less than the size of the buffer. So actually to go back up here where we had the 24, this is actually getting the my res value, which is the size of the buffer. So moving on to the next line here, we have a move from a quad word pointer, which is a 64-bit value that is located at RSP plus username 16. Well, username at offset 16, we know is the current size of the string. This is at offset zero, that's at offset 16, and that's at offset 24. So offset 16 is the current size of the string. Now let's try to figure out what this env is. Let's hit enter on it. And we can see that that is the R8 register. And it was used for, looks like the last parameter here to the main function. Let's actually change that to be R8 eight value and let's go back with alt back arrow so this line is moving the current length of username into the r8 register this is performing a comparison between that length value and the value of 15. well we know that this compare is performing an internal subtraction in order to affect the e flags register let's actually see what would happen in our case of entering the door to back this is going to be 15 and this is going to be 15. so that's a subtraction of 15 from 15 which leads to a result of zero. So if the user enters the door to back, the comparison will result in a subtraction that yields the value zero internally. That value is not used for anything except to set flags internally based on running this comparison operation. But that is usually done because the subsequent instructions are going to do things based on how flags were affected. And we see the following instruction is a jump instruction. It will jump if the zero flag is not set. JNZ, jump if not zero. There is an alias for this, which is jump if not equal. That's because if the values are not equal, the result of the subtraction will not be zero. So jump if not equal is the same thing as jump if not zero. Likewise, there is an instruction JE, which is jump if equal, and that would be represented by jump zero, JZ. JE is equal to JZ and jump if not equal is equal to jump if not zero. So 15 happens to be the length of the door to back. So this is performing a subtraction of that length from whatever the actual length is of what the user entered. If the two values are not equal, it will skip these subsequent operations. So we can actually hit L and change this label to username not equal to secret. And we can see that that sort of happens in the uh, decompiled C code here. If username current length length is equal to 15, then continue forward with the comparison. Otherwise, we know that they can't be equal. So if we go back and look at that traits equal that we looked at earlier, you can see it checks to see if the size of each string is equal. If they aren't equal, then there's really no need to perform the compare. And that's really what happens here when it's checking that the size matches 15. The next line loads underscore argv with the start of the address of the door to back. So we can hit enter on the door to back and we can see that's a label that references an address that contains the string the door to back. Let's go back with alt back. Let's highlight argv and hit enter and we can see that that's the rdx register. So as with the others, let's hit the L key and type in rdx value. Let's do alt back and we can now see that it's loading the address of the Lador to back string into the RDX register. So at this point, the address of Lador to back is in the RDX register. The RCX register contains whatever was last in the RCX register. You can see that the RCX register here got the value of username stir and it has one of these values so it either has this value or this value depending on which buffer was used if you remember so the whole point is that the rcx register is set with the start address of whatever the user entered from the terminal window the rdx register contains the address of the start of the string lador de back as you recall, the calling conventions say that the first two arguments to a function are passed in RCX and RDX. We are therefore calling memcomp with the first argument being the address of what the user entered from the command line and the string Lador to back. 
The next argument after RCX and RDX is going to be R8 because the calling convention says that the first four parameters are passed in RCX, RDX, R8, and R9. So in the context we're looking at, this is the address of username. RDX is the address of the door de back. And R8 equals 0xf or 15 in decimal. We know that because we know that they have to be equal to each other in length. If username contains a total of 15 characters there and these do not match the door to back, but they are both 15. So what we know is the strings are both the same length at this point, and we know that R8 contains that length, which is 15. And that's what's happening here, where it loads R8 with the length of the string, and then it'll check to see and make sure that it's equal to the length of the door to back. We don't know if the string is equal to the door to back, but we know that its length is equal to the door to back's length. They're both 15. If if it gets past this JNZ. This JNZ will jump if this comparison is between two unequal values. That is, if R8 is not 15, this jump will occur, and that'll just skip over everything. The next step was to load RDX with Lador to back, and now all the registers are already set up. So you can kind of see the registers were loaded and they were used to perform checks, but the registers also contain values that are going to be used for this call. So this was done on purpose by the compiler it loaded RCX with username and it used that for comparisons but it also is using that for the setup to this call. It then loaded R8 with the length of what the user entered and if that length was matching the door to back's length it would allow it to pass down to here. So it was loading R8 not only to check that its value was within a valid range which is 15 in this case but also to set up for this call down here should it be successful. And RDX finally is loaded with the start address of Lador door to back, which is being performed merely to set up for this memcomp. This RDX value is not used in between here by any instructions. It's just the final step in setting up for this call. So it's kind of interesting. You see RCX is being loaded to do some work in comparing things and getting the right value into RCX. R8 is loaded and it's used to compare to make sure that the length is 15. So these values were loaded not only to do some comparisons and checks, but also to set up for this call. And that's kind of the wonder of what a compiler does. RDX is the final setup and then memcomp is called with the three arguments. This first argument is RCX, this second argument is RDX, and this last argument in the R8 register. It's shown here as 0xf, but over here we know that 0xf is actually loaded into the R8 register. So we know that memcomp will return 0 if the two strings or the two byte arrays, if you will, are equal. So after memcomp returns whatever value it returns, and if it returns zero, then we know that the two byte arrays match. If it's non-zero, we know they don't match. So that's what this test is going to perform. So if we go to the processor manual and we look at test, it's referred to as a logical compare, but this is computing a bitwise logical AND of the first and second operands. And it tells you it will set the SF, ZF, and PF status flags. Those are flags in the E flags register. This is the sign flag, the zero flag, and the parity flag. ICMP result was a name that we gave over here. But since we know that a function returning an integral number of some kind, pointer or integer value, returns that value in RAX, if I hit enter on ICMP result, we can see that that's equal to the EAX register. Knowing that now, we can actually rename this to RAX value and then go alt back and this will make a little bit more sense to us. So this is performing a test with RAX RAX. So it's performing an AND of RAX to itself. Now if you AND a value with itself and it is anything but zero, then the zero flag will not be set. But if this is zero and this is zero, then this test operation will result in setting the zero flag to one. And as we know, if the zero flag is set, then it will not jump on JNZ. If the zero flag is not set, meaning if the return value from memcomp was anything but zero, this test will result in the zero flag not being set and JNZ 
will jump to this label, which is the same label, by the way, that was used up here. So we can see this comparison failed. So it jumped to username not equal to secret. And here it's saying that memcomp returned a non-zero value. So jump to the same username not equal to secret. So basically, if memcomp returns zero, it'll end up going into this area here. The first thing it will be saying is very good. And then it will go down here and say, please do tell me a secret, will you? And there'll be similar things in here. As you can see, there's a lot of other opcodes being used. But after you learn some fundamentals, it'll become very easy to kind of learn how new codes that you haven't seen before work. So this will continue on down here and it will be using some other instructions. We're not going to continue on. We're going to hold it right there. As, as you can see, though, you can get a lot accomplished, if not almost everything you need sometimes, by just using the excellent decompile output that Ghidra provides. However, jumping onto this side can sometimes be quite fruitful. So anyway, I think this is a good stopping point. I think this is just a good icebreaker introduction. Uh, you know, there could be another tutorial that goes more in depth into some stuff. We could actually use some debuggers and have like a debugger tutorial. There's a whole lot of possibilities and I'd be really interested to hear, first of all, did you like this tutorial? Was it useful at all? And if you like this tutorial, is there some other part two or something that you would like to see? And if you like this video, if you could click the like button below and if you want to subscribe to the channel, that would be wonderful as well. And other than that, it'd be great to hear your thoughts below. All right, that's it for this video. Thanks for stopping by. Happy reversing. Till the next video, take care. Be well, be safe, all that jazz. All right, thanks. Bye-bye.